again. I just don't give him my camera. I'm picking it up. Sorry about that. Hi my lovelies and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So I, I was kind of like racking my brain for a good topic for a video um, and then it hit me that about a year ago or it's almost been a year since I made my Franny K. Stein mad scientist video. That was one of my first videos that was me experimenting with the niche that I'm now in and I really had a fun time making it. I also realized damn I haven't read for a while. Obviously that's not true. Um, I just didn't know how to introduce this video. It's actually quite a coincidence that I'm making another Jim Benton video um, a year later. Does that mean this is a yearly tradition now? Anyway, in that video I briefly mentioned Dear Dumb Diary when I was talking about how there was potentially supposed to be a movie for Franny K. Stein, but you know, there was a movie for Dear Dumb Diary. And then I realized there's actually not any videos about Dear Dumb Diary. So now I just kind of feel obligated to make this my thing. So yes, although Franny K. Stein is my personal favorite of of his and actually it's Jim's too. Um, I think it's safe to say that Dear Dumb Diary is by far the most popular book of Jim Benton's. But let me stop assuming that you guys know everything and let's get into the topic of today's video. Basically, Dear Dumb Diary is a series of children's novels by Jim Benton. If you don't know who Jim Benton is, firstly, I'm judging you. Secondly, he's a American illustrator and New York Times best-selling author known for various licensed properties such as Happy Bunny, Cat Wad, Franny K. Stein, Mad Scientist, and of course, Dear Dumb Diary. But the other thing that makes this series kind of stand out is while it's known for its books, of course, um, iconic, it's also known for its um, feature film, live action version. Yes, Jim Benton went on to help create an iconic live action musical adaptation of Dear Dumb Diary as a writer. He was the writer along with the director of the film. Her name is Kristen or Kirsten, I actually don't know which pronunciation it is. And this film was released actually by Hallmark, I believe. Um, it was released September 6th, 2013. So with last month being the film's 10th anniversary, I thought now more than ever would be the perfect time really to revisit the iconic books that really started it all. And then make our way over to the film at the end and talk about the potential for the series in the future. So with that all established, um, I can't really get into the plot of the books without getting into our main characters, so let's just jump right into it. Who are you people? Starting off, we have absolute legend Jamie Kelly. Dear Dumb Diary follows her as our protagonist, with the stories being told purely through her perspective of, you know, her Dear Dumb Diary. And no one else's perspectives are obviously shown since we are reading her diary after all. Jamie is fully prepared for this happening as well as she, you know, puts warnings in her diaries. Usually they match the theme of the book, kind of switched up, varying on which book we're reading. And these warnings entail about how nobody, especially Angeline or her parents, has permission to actually read her diary. Jamie would not like this video. But would she subscribe? That wasn't funny. <laughs> Anyway, next is Isabella, our other main character who's usually in the spotlight of these stories since she's Jamie's best friend. The thing about Isabella is she's obviously a pretty manipulative person and even just pretty nasty at times, but Jamie wholeheartedly chooses to ignore this and she really sees Isabella as um, wise and nice. In other words, she's kind of a walking red flag, but never fails to really have her moments within the books, so she's still a pretty enjoyable character and brings a lot of chaos. And finally, we have Angeline. From just the pre-reading, do not read my diary warnings alone, there is an awful lot of Angeline in these books, who Jamie is technically frenemies with, and I use that term pretty loosely, to be honest. Like, she consistently writes in her diary that Angeline Angeline is too beautiful and is plotting against her. You're skinny, you're blonde, you're pretty. You're telling me nobody at school hates you? Wake up. But more importantly, notes how her and Angeline have a crush on Hudson Rivers, aka the eighth cutest guy in her school. But throughout the books, I feel like his crush kind of like shifts a lot and he really seems to like both of them pretty equally. But one thing as you read these books, um, readers can quickly take note of is the fact that Angeline is exaggerated by Jamie, who's writing all the diary entries, and is actually a really pretty good friend to Jamie. But of course, Jamie thinks um, she's out to get her 
something due to her envy for Angeline. But she's not like your typical blonde popular girl in any type of franchise. She's actually a good person. Other characters I won't dive deep into in order to avoid spoilers, but are featured heavily so I'm still gonna mention them are Jamie's family, of course, like her mom, dad, and Aunt Carol, Angeline's uncle, and Jamie's dog, Stinker. When you first open any of the books, we are greeted with some just general information about Jamie. This diary is property of Jamie Kelly, school, macro middle school, locker 101, best friend, Isabella, pet, Stinker, which is a beagle, eye color green, hair color brownishly blonde with brunette brownness. And secondly, we see our first warning um, to read no further. Dear who was ever reading my dumb diary, are you sure you're supposed to be reading somebody else's diary? Maybe I told you that you could, so that's okay. But if you were Angeline, I did not give you permission, so stop it. If you are my parents, then yes, I know that I'm not allowed to call people idiots and fools and goons and halfwits and pinheads and all that, but this is a diary. I didn't really call them anything. I wrote it. And if you punish me for it, then I will know that you read my diary, which I am not giving you permission to do. By the power vested in me, I do promise that everything in this diary is true, or at least as true as I think it needs to be. Signed, Jamie Kelly. And then this is followed by a message directly addressed to Angeline. P.S. If this is Angeline reading this, then <laughs> I got you. I have written this in poison ink on a special poison paper and you had better run and call 911 right now and then this is followed up with a message directly um, directed at hudson pss if this is you hudson reading this i have an antidote to the poison and it is conveniently available to you through a simple phone call to my house but don't mention the poison thing to my parents if they answer i think they might be all like weird about me poisoning people a message like this is presented in every copy of these books. Um, generally, it's like switched around a little bit. I'm not going to read every single one, but it's kind of cool that they tweak it depending on what the plot of the book is. As for the story itself, we follow Jamie Kelly in her like daily life. It's exactly what the title suggests, okay? It's all in her point of view, written in her dumb diary. So how we're gonna do this is basically I'm going to... I read, <laughs> I already did it, I read 12 books, which is the entirety of um, series one, and I watched the movie. So we're gonna break down all of the books, and then we're gonna get into the movie and we'll kind of do a comparison of like what stayed true to the books in the movie, that type of thing. But without further ado, let's get into the first book. I said names wrong. Let's get into it. I said assistant principal Devins instead of Devin, and I kept calling Isabella Isabel at certain times. I think it's because I had to say her name so much. And then also when it gets to the movie portion of this video, I called the um, Juvenile Optometry Federation the foundation. So please ignore that. Anyway, let's get into the video. It's all in my tears and which is titled, Let's Pretend This Never Happened. It was originally released in 2004. <sighs> That's right, guys. This book is older than me. Okay, jokes aside, um, this book actually sets up our story and introduces us to Jamie and like all our main characters, with this being the first installment of the series. Also, fun fact about the titles for the first four-ish books, Jim Benton thought of them like kind of on the spot after the pitch like went well. The pitch is only about two pages long and you know the series got greenlit through that and they wanted to know like if he had some other, what other ideas he had and so he basically just made up some titles on the spot which later he had to kind of work in reverse to like he thought of the title but he had to think of the story to go along with it. He also wrote it on shitty cheap paper because he felt like that's what Jamie would have access to and he also drew it all with one pen throughout the whole series which is kind of impressive. It's a lot of writing. Anyway, I can't really read the plots for these books because as I said, they are diary style, point of view, written. So let's get on into the plot of the first book. The first thing we start off with is hearing Jamie recount how she was almost nicknamed um, today at school by this one kid who's infamous for giving other kids nicknames um, like Butt Butlington. This is very middle school. Jamie doesn't even know the kid who was given that nicknames real name because he's been referred to like by Butt Butlington for so long. She also gives us this beautiful visual aid. But as the story goes, Jamie was eating a peach at lunch and another like fell out of her bag. So the nicknaming kid goes, Hey peach girl. Jamie quickly um, picked up her peach thinking nobody had heard her possible new nickname. But just then, in Jamie's words, um, some adorable music laughter that sounds like somebody tickling a baby by rubbing its tummy with 
the puppy comes from behind her. And when she turns around, it's none other than Angeline, who Jamie says was probably evilly committing this nickname to memory. First, I didn't think I'd be mentioning this point so early on in the video, but even just from the get-go, as we like progress in this first book, we see Angeline isn't even an evil person, like plotting against her, and is actually in a way Jamie's friend. We'll see how the friendship progresses through these 12 books but Jamie just happens to be very envious of her. I think a part of where this comes from too is her crush on Hudson Rivers, the eighth cutest guy in her grade, seems to interact with Angeline a lot, and she clearly calls Angeline a boyfriend stealer later in the book, so... But we're introduced to him as well in this first book, and his first appearance is an interaction with Angeline taking notice of her Choco Mint Lip Smacker. This also happens to be um, Isabella's signature flavor, even though it's the grossest flavor they ever made. Of course, Dumb Diary, you understand that I am destroyed. What you may not fully appreciate is the impact that this scandalous event is having on Isabella. Anyway, the other plot of this book is like Jamie's little cousin um, is coming to stay at their house uh, in a few weeks which will lead into a semi-important event, uh, event later on. But this is the perfect moment to say too, oh my god, there are so many points while reading these books for this video where I just started laughing out loud, either because like of what Jamie had said was like so true or just like so out of pocket. I know that your uncle's kids are your cousins, but then there are things like first cousins and second cousins and cousins once removed. What does that mean? Cousins once removed? I had a wart removed once. Like, I'm 18 years old, and I could not tell you what a cousin once removed is. It's kind of, like, funny how Jim Benton was, like, able to encapsulate the middle school girl experience, like, so well. In other news, Jamie started eating school lunch um, because of the peach incident. So we get introduced to the cafeteria monitor, Mrs. Brentford. Another thing that happens is um, Jamie tries to dye her hair like Angeline. I picked the one that looked like Angeline's hair color, which they call Glorious Heavenly Sunshine. I was trying not to copy Angeline. It just happened to be the first one I grabbed in the fourth store I looked. I aspired to be Jamie's level of delusional. It failed miserably and Jamie went back to the store to buy a kit to dye her hair back to normal before like anyone could see. Angeline also had some hair troubles. She got it tangled in one of her um, apparently Jillian things she has hanging from her backpack, like keychains and stuff. So the nurse had to cut like a good chunk of her hair out. Luckily for Angeline, this resulted in her starting a beret wearing trend because she wore a beret um, to cover her bald spot. Freaky little girl with a French beret. Just know a thing or two about that. The next day though, um, Jamie ended up in the nurse's office because she felt like sick from her mother's horrible cooking but when she was there she saw like the chunk of Angeline's hair sticking out of the trash and you know what she did? Uh -huh. She took it! Jamie also gets sent to the principal's office later and decides to plot to steal Angeline's permanent record. Instantly I knew I had a goal in life to possess and share the horrible contents of this folder with the world and to reveal to mankind the boy scent thief that Angeline really is. Which is an idea that Jamie can't seem to stop thinking about after coming up with it. So like two days later, she finally um, decides the only way to accomplish her plan is to get sent to the principal's office once again. During lunch, when somebody decided to fling meatloaf at <laughs> Mrs. Brentford, she, you know, she wasn't letting anyone leave until they finished their food because meatloaf Thursdays are very serious at Macro Middle School. Jamie basically took it as her opportunity when the person, like, she was saying who did that and no one would confess, so Jamie took the fault for it. However, it did not help at all. Um, Jamie didn't get Angeline's permanent record until the very next day. Long story short, she was able to sneak into the principal's office, but leaves the folder like in her locker over the weekend. So she waits the whole weekend um, anxiously because she can't even read it and then brings it home when um, her cousin, like is finally staying at her house but then her little cousin steals it and immediately like she can't find it so she still isn't able to read it but speaking of her cousin here's where he really becomes important to the story about a weekish later when her mom is meeting her aunt at Jamie's school to um pick up her little cousin which why wouldn't she just stop by Jamie's house 
them meeting at the school is such a weird place. Jamie goes to class um, knowing she can't present her mythology report, which she got assigned at the beginning of this book, but she can't present it because even though she did it, Stinker ate it, and she can't just admit like her dog ate her homework because who's gonna believe that? What she doesn't know, however, is her cousin, Eddie, um, had actually escaped. So just before she's about to admit she doesn't have the assignment, because she was supposed to present first because of something else that happened when I think it was like a comment she made, but he was simultaneously having an allergic reaction. Um, Jamie had actually packed her own lunch today, I forgot why, but she had made like a sandwich with some jam and then the jam disappeared and she thought Stinker ate the jam off her sandwich, but it was actually Eddie and Eddie is allergic to strawberries, which is like one of the main rules they have like when taking care of him. It's just that like, hey, he's allergic to strawberries and it was strawberry jam, obviously, um, if I did say that before. And the other thing is um, Angeline's hair clump that Jamie still has, Eddie is like obsessed with. So Jamie had it like in her backpack Eddie ends up pulling it out of Jamie's backpack and using it like a beard. Well, basically talking, but it sounds like he's just jabbering some nonsense the whole time because, you know, he's like swollen from having that allergic reaction. Ironically, as Jamie was trying to grab him, we came full circle as her lunch bag got knocked over and a peach fell out. And in Jamie's mind, this was just the perfect opportunity for her nickname to be solidified as Peach Girl. But then in like a full 180, Angeline walks up to the front of the class and claims she did her project with Jamie and that Eddie was their visual aid of a troll. Angeline was helping Jamie and she didn't even call her Peach Girl. So they basically made it up as they went along for the rest of the presentation and as they finished, Jamie's aunt came in to take Eddie away, and then in the end they got an A on the report. And to backtrack to the permanent record of Angeline's, it was actually in her little cousin's backpack, which she left in the classroom. So did she ever read it? Well, no. Jamie decides because Angeline helped her that she's kind of like, why did I do this? And she takes it back to the principal's office. It's kind of like crazy to me how she didn't get caught. Like really impressive. Um, but yeah, so she never even read it. Basically stole it for no reason. And that was my summary of book one. I, that one actually felt kind of short, but these kind of get lengthier as we solidify our characters and everything. May your pants be haunted and the fun continue. The next book, book two, is titled My Pants Are Haunted. This time, warning-wise, Jamie happens to have an entire room under hidden video surveillance. In just a moment, little doors will slide open and flesh-eating rats will stream into said room. And just like, you know, tiny venomous cowboys, scorpions, will be riding the rats. She also mentions Margaret and Sally, who you might be like, Who are you people? But in just a moment, we'll see how these two other kids at Jamie's school kind of play a significant role in this book. We also get a section for Isabella, who apparently keeps reading Jamie's diary. You know, it should be a bit of a red flag to someone per se, but we all know Jamie considers Isabella nice and wise. I also didn't mention Isabella a lot in the first book. I don't really think she was very relevant to the plot, to be honest. And Isabella tries to clear her name by stating the following, Dear Jamie, I am so sure I do not read your diary, so get over yourself. P.S. I agree about all the stuff you said about your mom. I don't know. I mean, that kind of sounds like something someone who read this diary would say, but nah. Anyway, let's jump into the book. Um, Isabella and Jamie actually spot Angeline in the park in this book, and they assume, like, that who she's with are her two sisters because they look nothing like her. And this kind of confirms their theory that she's been plastic surgeoned. It would cost a fortune to do that much plastic surgery on somebody who started out as ugly as we hope Angeline did. So we figure that Angeline's dad is some big doctor. On top of everything else, she's probably rich. But then a few days later, they actually spot Angeline at the same park, but with a different set of kids. Instead of realizing, Oh, hey, maybe she's just babysitting. Jamie had this to say. Obviously, her plastic surgeon dad has already started cutting up the kids to make perfect little miniature Angelines out of them. Now, this isn't that important to the plot. It was just kind of really funny how they continue to be, like, so convinced and only double down with no doubts about, like, these, these types of things with Angeline. This eventually leads up to Isabella, like, asking Angeline directly. Angeline looked pretty puzzled. She said that her dad worked at an office. He's an accountant. I asked, what about her little sisters? We see with her at the park all the time. Her dad keeps doing plastic surgery on them. Those aren't her sisters. Those are kids she babysits. 
and they don't keep changing. They're different kids. I know what you're thinking. Dumb diary. Why does a rich girl need to babysit? Turns out Angelina's not rich. She babysits because she needs to. She's saving up to buy, get this, a new pair of Bella Zura jeans. Now, what are the significance of Bella Zura jeans, you may ask? Well, one of the times they see Angelina and those kids at the park is on the way to the mall to help Margaret because she's Jamie's new lab partner for science and her and Isabella want to give her a makeover, basically. It's funny because it started with Miss Palmer, their teacher, switching Jamie and Isabella as partners. Miss Palmer had to split up another set of lab partners in order to separate Isabella and me. Sure, she could have paired me up with Margaret Parker. Total reject, but she didn't. Dear sweet Miss Palmer presented to me like a humongous plate of cookies, my new lab partner, Hudson Rivers. She gave Hudson's old partner, Margaret Parker, to Isabella, like a plate of wet socks. Well, um, maybe she shouldn't have been so loud because that didn't really last long. Because Jamie ends up bringing up a harrowing life update in the middle of the night right after she decided to watch a scary movie. I can't believe I stayed up this late. It's like the middle of the night. There was this scary movie on TV tonight about this little girl who finds an old doll that's haunted, which anybody could tell was going to be haunted because she was really sweet girl and she really loved the doll and there's just no way the movie is gonna let a little sweet girl be happy with her doll if it's not a good movie anyway but now i'm in serious trouble because i still have science homework i need to finish and i blame my mom who's the one who let me have this tv in my room after all after i begged for two years non-stop i'd like to write more but i'm really tired and i have to get this homework finished now as we can see by this page jamie was about to follow it up but didn't exactly get to finish her thoughts. So we discover the next day, um, with her next entry, her worst fears have come true. We can tell by these beautiful visual depictions, once again, I'm saying that sarcastically, I guess, but Jim Benton's art style is literally like my favorite. These doodles are like so silly. That's right, I fell asleep last night without finishing my science homework, which means as predicted, Miss Palmer did bite my head off and then it got worse, figuring the problem was with the lab partner arrangement, she switched Hudson with Margaret. Now Margaret is my lab partner and Isabella has Hudson. So with this, um, Margaret comes over the following day to catch up on homework per request of Miss Palmer. And it's here where Isabella happens to stop by because her perfume jar experiment, which I forgot to mention earlier, basically Isabella has been collecting um, those like scratch and sniff perfume like samples from magazines and then putting them in a jar for her top secret fragrance project she's been working on to create the ultimate super fragrance. Jamie is like certain it's connected to her ongoing obsession with popularity, saying the following specifically, I know Isabella belongs in a cage, but she's my best friend, so one does what one must. Anyway, <laughs> she's been hiding, um, these in this baby food jar in the science classroom with all the scents in it but now it's disappeared which is why she came over so basically she suggests the makeover and surprisingly margaret isn't really opposed to this either she kind of likes the attention i think so the very next day jamie's mom ends up taking the three of them to the mall and they drop margaret at sally's house afterwards um, another important event happened at the mall though. When we were at the mall, mom found me a pair of Belazer jeans. They are the coolest jeans ever made and she bought them for me without me even having to ask. But the next day um, at school, however, is when shit really starts to go down following Margaret's brand new look. Her new look basically upsets the popularity balance as they know it. And this is very important stuff, guys. Some of the medium popular kids were sitting um, with the less popular than medium kids. For a moment, I thought she was nuts until I saw Margaret was sitting with the ultra mega popular table. Isabella said this really should not be happening. For Margaret to escalate that quickly, it could destroy the natural order of the universe and worst. Isabella said that it meant that we had fallen down a notch. This went as far to even bringing Angeline down herself. So at this point, they may have just destroyed the entire universe. Oh my God, a tornado is forming, bye. 
this visual um, is actually very helpful here to get an idea of the system that's in place. So first we have movie stars, then Chip, which surprisingly he is the most popular kid, but he's literally never mentioned. Like he's only mentioned one other, one other time, and I think it's like in the very last book. Then Margaret, um, who's wedged in between like all of a sudden in front of Angeline, and then Hudson, Jamie, Isabella, Sally, and Pickers of Noses. Very standard. But, you know, um, you thought that was scary? Well, this is where it truly gets sinister. As we were standing there, alternatively blaming each other for making over Margaret, in the first place, we noticed Hudson walking over to the mid-popular table. Just as he did, my pants, how can I put this, decided to join the conversation. You may get my drift diary, my pants cut the cheese let one fly, baked a batch of brownies, got the picture? I know what you're thinking. Diary, pants can't pass gas. And yet, now luckily Isabella is able to blame a innocent bystander, but you know, with all this stuff going down, this is where the title kind of comes in. They realize the pants are to blame for everything that's going on. Like, you know, the thing with Margaret and everything, they blame the jeans that um, Jamie's mom bought. The next day when Jamie is no longer wearing the pants, Margaret shows back to school um, in her normal attire and everything, but the popularity meters stay relatively the same, shockingly. Isabella said it wasn't the makeover that boosted Margaret's popularity and forced us down, it was the pants. She said it wasn't my loud yahoo in science that got me switched again so that I'm partners with known goon Mike Pinsetti. It was the pants. I want to note the person she's saying she's now partners with is the guy that like the nickname kid that tried to give her the nickname Peach Girl. And she said it wasn't me who had done the you know what all over Hudson Rivers. It was the pants! So Isabella ends up spending the night because Jamie doesn't really want to spend another night alone with those pants. And the next day they plan to drive the spirits out. They started by attempting to rip the pants to shreds, though Jamie was pretty hesitant because they were still really cool pants after all. The next idea was to use a Ouija board to contact the tormented ghosts in Jamie's pants. And I just want to read this next section purely because it's my favorite. And it literally killed me the first time I read it. I don't have a Ouija board, so we tried to do it with a Monopoly game. Sadly, we didn't really make much progress, except we decided to try to make charm bracelets with the dog and carve race pieces. Let me just stop and say, this is so Franny Stein coded. I know Dear Dumb Diary is the more popular series, but as I said, you know, Franny is always gonna be my favorite. I don't care. Anyway, um, to continue on, this was the part that really got me. I thought we should light candles and speak some sort of mystic chant. We're not really well informed on chants, so we said the Pledge of Allegiance, which I know, technically speaking, is not a mystic chant, but, you know, still sounds pretty creepy when you say it in a low zombie-like tone. In a dark room with flashlights, Dad doesn't allow lit candles in my room, so we had to make do. And finally, after that sad attempt, they decided to stomp the evil out of the pants, in Jamie's words. This took form of laying the pants out in the backyard, and then stomping all over them in various evil-destroying karate-like moves. After they realized how dumb they probably looked, um, without the haunting pants context, they just decided to, like, put them in the washing machine and call it a day. But to no avail, though, the girls' efforts were unsuccessful because Jamie wakes up the next morning to the pants back in her room as good as new practically, like, they were never even touched. Unfortunately for Jamie, Stinker also happened to chew a hole in her last pair of non-evil jeans. What Jamie thinks is happening is Stinker is eating all her pants. He keeps putting holes in her pants, so she's, like, really mad at him. So when she got those jeans, it was like, wow, I have a, you know, pair of pants that don't have a hole in them. Now, remember when I brought up Isabella confronting Angeline on her surgeon dad earlier? Well, we find out from this interaction that she's babysitting because she's saving up for some Bellazura jeans, the same ones that are supposedly cursed. So through this interaction, she finds out that Angeline is the same size and Isabella actually offers to sell her the jeans for half the price, which Angeline agrees to. The transaction doesn't actually happen until the next day though, and boy does shit really go down today. A detail I forgot to mention is Jamie made a have you been mean to your beagle today, sign with glitter, and the next day her mom notices and asks, like, why? Jamie explains the whole predicament, and her mom actually reveals that it wasn't Stinker, it was her that made the holes. After, in the beginning of the book, they had a little discussion about clothing, 
um, Jamie's mom decided to try to get with it with the trends. She found out that lighter blue denim was the, the cool new jean of the moment, and she looked through magazines on tips for bleaching jeans. She couldn't find any, so she just decided to give it a whirl on her own. She had spilled some bleach on my jeans the first time. It turns out bleach can eat away a big round hole through a pair of pants. So she tried a couple more times, but those were not any better. You'll remember, she felt so bad that she bought me the Belzer jeans. Yeah, and even worse, she had bought two pairs of these jeans because they didn't magically repair themselves. Jamie's mom rushed back to the mall to buy a new pair when she saw the pair Isabella and her had destroyed, thinking that she had once again destroyed them in the wash. Another worthy mention is that Jamie has been mentioning every now and then updates on Isabella's sinus problem. And when Jamie goes to school that day, it's finally cleared up. So pretty quickly, like through the day, during science class, Isabella had come up with her own conclusion about who had stolen the super fragrance jar. And it was none other than Sally, Margaret's nerd friend, or Gerd, as Isabella defines it. When the bell rang, I went out to the hall and Angeline strolled up to me. She wanted the pants and I pulled them out of my backpack and handed them to her. She dashed to the bathroom to try them on. From inside the science room, I heard Isabella and Sally squawking about something and then I heard a jar break and then the fire alarm went off. Sally had taken interest in Isabella's top secret super fragrance project, so she was the one who had taken Isabella's jar full of the perfume samples and she'd done it for none other than Hudson Rivers. Sally used Isabella's powerful perfume concoction on Margaret by sneaking some into her backpack the day she had gone over to her house to study after the mall makeover. So with that, Sally saw how the fragrance actually worked and boosting Margaret's popularity. Because even the next day when Margaret is back to her normal self, um, she was still as popular as ever. Now remember how their science partners get switched quite often? Well, they got switched one more time after Sally did a study session with Margaret and Isabella, causing them to get their homework wrong, prompting another partner switch, and hoping the luck of the draw um, that she'd finally get put with Hudson, which she did. And she probably would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for Isabella's sinuses um, clearing up. Isabella like smelled the distinctive super fragrance as she passed Sally's desk today and practically jumped Sally to snatch the jar out of her backpack, um, which they fought over and then it fell and broke open. And then Miss Palmer, um, overcome by the fumes, tripped the alarm, thinking it was some sort of like chemical accident. As Jamie said best, it was a total Scooby-Doo moment. Shortly after this, Angeline, who had been changing into her new Bella Zara jeans, walked out of the school, and this time they had holes in them that Stinker actually did chew as an act of revenge. Suddenly, I understood why. It was clear to me that I had told Stinker he was 20 pounds overweight. In dog weight, that's about 140 pounds. No wonder he was angry. Nobody wants to be told that they look 100 pounds, 140 pounds overweight. The jeans were ruined. In the end, this luckily ended up being the next big beret trend um, of the school, and she had successfully sold the jeans to Angeline. It's all in my tears and diary. Next, we have book three, which is titled Am I the Princess or the Frog? And let me just say, I found all these books digitally, like just like I did when I reread Franny K. Stein, and this book specifically was like the hardest one to find. I don't know why. I'm sorry in advance if I end up missing something, but this is like pictures someone took of the whole book and it was uploaded online. So I'm pretty sure it's pretty solid. So starting off strong, we remember our lovely Mrs. Brentford, the lunch lady and how Thursdays are meatloaf day. Well, Jamie basically made the comment that people on Fear Factor wouldn't even finish the school's meatloaf, which is actually pretty funny, which was said quietly, but not quietly enough, considering Mrs. Brentford heard and confronted her. She came right over and said to me, what? What is so terrible about this meatloaf? And then, dear dumb diary, she took a bite. Okay, here's the thing. I don't hate teachers. I actually kind of like them. But when Mrs. Brentford took a bite of the meatloaf and her mouth was filled with the flavor that many have described as a combination of petting zoo in July and a burning bag of hair, 
I just have to tell you, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. I'm not even sure how to describe it exactly. I think Mrs. Brentford herself um, summed it up best when she said, call 911. The following day, Mrs. Brentford did not show up back to school and Isabella revealed that they were actually gonna get a new lunch lady um, some at some point next week because she was actually in the hospital with spontaneous tuberculosis. And then the next day when Jamie was expecting a call from Isabella, Jamie kept answering the phone basically like whenever it would ring. But one was a call from a lady asking to speak to her mom who she thought like sounded kind of familiar but couldn't quite make out who it was. But then like her mom wouldn't tell her who like the person who called was. So she didn't really think much of it until the next day because she really started to act strange, rushing Jamie out of the kitchen, like when she woke up, I guess, to eat breakfast, and offering her candy for breakfast if she just would go eat in front of the TV, which Jamie gladly accepted. But later on, she was cooking up a storm. Um, notoriously, Jamie's mom commits various food crimes to, onto her family, which are very, me they're mentioned quite frequently. This was typical mom behavior, but what was weird about it was that she cooked but like never actually inflicted it upon us in Jamie's words. They smelled, they heard, and even Stinker hid his dog dish but she packed it up in like Tupperware containers to put in the fridge and just ordered pizza instead. About a weekish later, um, Jamie's mom also like gets takeout tacos for dinner because she didn't have time to make dinner because she went to Mrs. Brentford's house for a visit. To clarify, she still hasn't like return to school and a student teacher named Mr. Prince has been filling in. They even had their first Thursday meatloaf free. How revolutionary. Jamie also like thinks he's in love with her because of an anonymous letter that's left in her locker signed by an MP which obviously was written by that nickname kid Mike Pinsetti. In the book she even references how back in the last book she smiled at him while being under the trance of Isabella's super perfume. That's like when she said Yahoo in science. They have another moment like that um, with being inflicted by Angeline's supposed shampooing technique that Isabella can't figure out if she made up or not. But Jamie's mom finally lets the cat out of the bag um, almost two weeks later that the lady on the phone was Mrs. Brentford and she had asked Jamie's mom for her meatloaf recipe so they could like use it to make a new improved school meatloaf. All the teachers know about my mom's cooking. Last year, the lemon squares my mom brought for the, a bake sale caused a dozen kids to lose their hearing for three days. Basically, she made that one loaf that one day um, when she was cooking, um, but then ordered pizza for dinner instead because it was for Mrs. Brentford. And she tried it, and then she asked Jamie's mom to make a big batch for the kids to try this week at school. Miss Brentford knows the kids hate the school's meatloaf and thinks that Jamie's mom could solve the problem. This whole time this is happening, Jamie has been trying to like get Stinker to run away from home so she doesn't have to submit a picture of him for Isabella's class art project on how pets look like their owners which Jamie finds insulting to her but also it's because it's gonna be hung up on the like I believe the bulletin board in the lunchroom for the whole school to see like a lot of their various art projects have been. Anyway because of her mom making such a big batch of meatloaf Stinker actually did run away. Mom said that one day I'd appreciate her cooking and she was right today I do. Stinker has run away from home. Isabella um, was also acting weird and not wanting Jamie to come over and making up excuses but both times Jamie showed up at her house like on her own accord. There was a kitten or two outside in like Isabella's front yard. Then Isabella opened the door and like took the kittens immediately and acted all strange. Isabella notoriously is bad at lying so Jamie finally got the truth like out of her about it all. So she used her powers of persuasion on her dad to make him take her to the mall to get a kitten which is one of the all-time cutest animals in the world. But Isabella says that um, in a little as a week the kitten's cuteness starts to fade so she wanted her pet to be like the cutest in the project so that everyone would say that Isabella was the cutest girl in our grade. So she told her dad that the kitten had ran away and she cried and cried until he took her to get a new one. But the replacement kitten started to lose its cuteness in about a week. So she replaced it the same way. She had been keeping the extras hidden in her room until the assignment was over. So I had her, right? Um, in my best TV lawyer voice, I pointed out the turtle which is her real pet, and that's what has to be used in the photo. Then she got all sinister and smiled this real horrible smile. Nope, she said. 
Last night, kittens one and two ate the turtle. A shame, really, but it works out all fine in the end. Uh? Um, I don't have any words. But what I do have a lot of words for is the day we've all been waiting for, um, the debut of Jamie's mom's um, meatloaf. Just like um, Isabella's evil plan, Mrs. Brentford's true colors really started to show here, but not like they were ever really hidden at all. Jamie's mom actually showed up to the school to see how everything was would go down, you know? And let's just say it was a disaster. Sickened kids quickly fled out of the cafeteria, and it became clear to Jamie that the only reason Mrs. Brentford had had Jamie's mom make the meatloaf for the school was to make her meatloaf look better by comparison, which is actually really sad because Jamie's mom was so excited and like she seemed so nice outside of her absolutely horrific cooking. When the cafeteria was practically empty except for Jamie and Angeline who hadn't had the meatloaf yet, for context, um, just before this all happened, Miss Anderson had hung up the photo assignments and Angeline walked up to Isabella's pet project and ripped off the photo of Stinker to replace it with a different photo she had pulled out of her pocket. It was a beautiful, stunning, immaculately groomed beagle like you'd see on the cover of American Beagle magazine. It's Stinker, she said. I found him wandering near our garbage cans last night. He was pretty scruffy looking, so I washed him up a little. Looked like he'd been dragged, if you can believe it. I figured this is how you'd want him to look for his photo. He's at my house right now. You can pick him up whenever you want. She handed me the horrible shot of Stinker that she had pulled down. It was an extreme makeover moment. Once again, here was Angeline, who actually did her art project with Jamie um, that got hung up on the teachers versus their younger selves and went out of her way to be genuinely nice absolutely flooring Jamie. Early in this book, um, walking home from Isabel's house after she got rejected from hanging out, um, she saw Angeline drive by in a minivan and they waved at each other and her mom happened to be driving the car whose hair is like nowhere near as nice as Angeline's which shocked Jamie. So within the same interaction, Jamie asked um, Angeline where she learned dog grooming from and Angeline said it's just like people's hair and actually compared her hair to stinkers. My mom is just as bad at hair as your mom is at cooking. When I was little, everyone made fun of me and it was pretty awful. I had to learn how to do my hair myself. I checked out books, I studied magazines, I've even examined the hair of people in front of me at the movies. I learned everything there was to know. If I didn't take care of it myself, it would look just like hers. To add further to the Angeline and Jamie lore, um, she also reveals that there was one kid who didn't make fun of her and she points to the shot of like Mrs. Brentford as a kid on their project. Jamie had actually thought the picture looked kind of like her, oddly enough, and it made her kind of like insecure in the moment, but she never actually said anything. So all along, Angeline was actually just kidding around with her, passing it off as Mrs. Brentford as a joke, um, when in fact it was a photo of Jamie from kindergarten that Jamie had given to Angeline herself. Jamie even ended up finding the picture Angeline gave her in kindergarten, although she couldn't even read the handwriting. The next day, Jamie ends up going over to Angeline's house to get Stinker, and she even offers to do Angeline's hair. But Angeline wanted to read her diary, because like that's where she ended up taping the photo of Angeline in her diary. So instead, she let her read the love poem she had been sent, um, and Angeline like was able to easily tell it was Mike's handwriting, because the poems weren't from Mr. Prince who was actually dating the art teacher, Miss Anderson. And also she's been, she said she's been sent like tons of notes. So that's also how she's able to tell so easily. And the third love note she had gotten, however, was different from the other two, which Jamie had um, assumed was to make it like less obvious. Well, it turns out the handwriting was from none other than Hudson Rivers, which set off Angeline. She handed me Stinker and ushered us out the door. I don't know which of us was more upset about leaving. Angeline, why? I said. What did I do? The poem, she said. The lousy one. That's Hudson's handwriting. Do you really think I'm gonna fix your hair up and help you win Hudson back? She slammed the door. So comparing her to Mrs. Brentford was really done with malicious intent after all. Yeah, this interaction not only confirmed the existence of Angeline's shampooing technique, the zone shampooing that Isabel wasn't sure if she made up, but also a few weeks ago when Jamie attempted her own version of that and was led away by a teacher because he thought she was having a seizure. Isabella had actually seen Hudson's reaction and it had worked. That's why Isabella had gone through with the photo assignment. She was jealous of Jamie the whole time. Also, while Jamie was caught up um, in her thing 
with Mr. Prince, Hudson had tried to talk to her on multiple occasions during lunch, and it wasn't like the last two books where she would say, and then I was just about to say something cool, but we'll never know what that was because Angeline did this or that. But again, she was fixated on Mr. Prince, so she straight up ignored Hudson. It was kind of shocking. It's all in my tears and diary. But onwards we go. Next is book number four, titled Never Do Anything Ever, which I will say is some absolutely inspiring advice. But this book starts off um, with Isabella and Jamie at the store getting Isabella some nair for her hairy arms, but they run into Angeline, except for they don't really run into her. Like, they notice her and they stop what they're doing to put on disguises and follow Angeline to see what she was buying, which ends up being just like a barrette. She ends up wearing it to school the next day, and Hudson had failed to even notice her spectacularness of her new hair accessory, but even more concerning, he had failed to notice the beauty Angeline had inflicted upon him. At first, I wondered if maybe Hudson just wanted to talk to me, and wasn't that interested in Angeline at all. I mean, come on, he did write me a love poem once, but unfortunately, Isabella was on hand and explained to me how I was wrong. Each book, Jamie kind of focuses on telling us about one or two subjects at school, which usually ties into the plot. And in this book, it was phys ed, which she says she has on Tuesdays and Thursdays. In phys ed this afternoon, Mr. Dover, his first name is really Ben. Can you believe it? <laughs> Okay, but the main plot of this book is how charitable Angeline is, starting off with this walkathon she asks Jamie and Isabella to pledge her for. Jamie and Isabella's morals really show here because they kind of like make fun of the fact that she'd be interested in donating money to people in need. They find out after the fact that she raised like $300, which is kind of insane, like good for her. Today at lunch, Isabella said she had heard Angeline raise $300 for her walkathon. They put up a sign by the office, and I couldn't believe how much more famous that made her. How famous does she need to be? If it was me, I would be totally satisfied with being partially famous, and not have to go making myself more famous all the time. And all day, Isabella couldn't stop talking about the money. She was like, 300 bucks? For a charity? Nobody even knows who these people are or anything. They just coughed up 300 buckaroos. So when she moves on to her next charity, they aren't even gonna bother to lie through their teeth, right? Wrong. Angeline is on to yet another charity. This one donates old clothes to people in need. She asked Annika and Hudson for contributions, and I was just about to contribute what a huge dipwad she is when Hudson said he actually thought it was pretty cool of Angeline to work so hard for needy people, and so did Annika, which made Isabella's head involuntarily nod because that's what her head does when several other people agree on something. Luckily for Jamie, um, she had just had a yard sale on Sunday and wouldn't have anything to contribute. This was also conveniently the same time as the walkathon, where Angeline got her photo taken for the paper. Anyway, for some reason, Jamie says the garage sale junk wasn't hers because she always like selflessly donates her old junk to charities and she claimed that she'd have a big bag of clothes to donate to her. Pretty good thinking, huh? Except for not having a big bag of clothes or even a little bag. Other than that, pretty good thinking. I have just three words for real giant big brain genius girls. Bangs, bangs, bangs. Is this Franny K. Stein shade? And the time comes shortly where it's time to give her imaginary bag of clothes that she promised to Angeline, and she was just gonna admit she didn't have anything. But then Hudson walked up and Jamie had an insane revelation. Angeline was beautiful on the inside. Hudson brought stuff also for her clothing charity and was, you know, impressed by her generosity. You think Angeline made me crazy before this? Dumb diary, that was nothing. Angeline isn't just beautiful on the outside, she may also be beautiful on the inside, which means she is so much, 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 much worse. So Isabella and Jamie come up with this plan to pretend that they are part of the same charity and go around door to door collecting clothes because Jamie has none and Isabella is like worried people could use her old clothes as like voodoo against her. Successfully, they got some clothes from neighbors nearby, and Isabella also collected money for an imaginary charity. Well, it's not imaginary. Isabella read about it online, but after her shenanigans with this last book, um, you know, we can tell how this pans out. When Jamie asks Isabella about the charity fund, like, a week or so later, she suddenly, like, forgot about it. It's almost like she's never heard of it. After a few minutes, it all came back to her. 
She said she had sent them the money and now that they had enough, we could stop raising. Oh, and FYI, the only reason they ever attempted charity work was to make themselves more beautiful. Shortly after this though, the school announced that they were holding a jump a jump rope-a-thon. So like Angeline's walk-a-thon, you get people to sponsor you based on the number of times you jump rope without tripping. Dear Dumb Diary, Isabella came over today to practice jump rope. We figured that our best strategy is to jump rope way longer than 100 jumps. I am an only child, which means that growing up, I often had nothing better to do than stand out in the driveway by myself practicing jump rope. And when the day of the jump rope-a-thon comes, we find out, like just before Jamie heads to the gym after school, that Isabella now has contacts. Contacts that she bought using the Juvenile Optometry Federation money. I felt sick. Isabella had faked the charity and I had helped her. Isabella, our inner beauty, what have you done? Look, she said, they're in my eyes, right? They're beautiful. However, when it got down to the last few jumpers, Angeline showed up and called Jamie over with this look on her face that Jamie had literally never seen before. And then she confessed on the verge of tears practically that she can't even jump rope by herself. This was so wonderfully tragic that Jamie almost burst out laughing. However, Angeline had like more than a hundred sponsors on her pledge sheet. So Jamie realized that her and Isabella should probably forfeit their pledges to twirl the rope for Angeline. Although Isabella wanted to say no, Jamie had the knowledge of like how she had bought her contacts held over her head. So she had to help Angeline. With this, Angeline was able to break her own record and raise $600 for the school. In the end, Jamie was able to truly master her inner beauty when Hudson was so impressed by her work in Fizzy Ed, but um, it was actually Angeline who had helped her um, all along, so she was honest. Basically, they had a project through the course of this book to get a baby doll across the gym um, to a team member. The kids were in groups of four, and they couldn't walk over or throw the baby because the floor was infested with imaginary crocodiles. So in the end, Angeline told Jamie to sacrifice. So she ended up sacrificing herself so all the baby dolls could get across safe. Like I said earlier with, you know, what projects she usually has going on that tie into the plot or message of the book, I think this does really well. So back to the conversation with Hudson, Angeline, who was nearby at her locker in return, acknowledged Jamie's help with the jump rope -thon, admitting without Jamie's help, she probably couldn't have raised a single dollar. Oh, and then later when Jamie went with Isabella and her dad to get those contacts fixed, they had an actual charity box like for underprivileged kids to get glasses. So Jamie donated $30 to make up for the money that she had unknowingly helped Isabella raise. The book then ends with Jamie receiving a note from Angeline where she confesses to buying this specific shirt that Jamie had mentioned when she was like listing things she'd be donating to her mom's garage sale. Jamie, I couldn't bear for other people to see this um, terrible thing of yours, so I bought it from the garage sale and I've been keeping it hidden in my room. Here's a good motto, never let your mom do anything ever. It's all in my diary. Moving on to the halfway-ish mark with book number five, aka Can Adults Become Human? I've got to say, this has to be my favorite title so far, and once again, Jim uh, thought of this on the spot, which is pretty impressive. Now, most of the books after this point are the ones I haven't read, shockingly. I know that's right, I'm a fraud. Um, can I even call myself a fan now? I mentioned this in my Franny K. Stein video that I didn't read one book in that series because I religiously got all the books from my school's library, and for Dear Dumb Diary, they had even less of the books. There was like maybe three or four, give or take. I don't remember which ones specifically. Besides like books one through two, which I know we had, um, I only remember the cover of book one specifically, and I just remember the plot of book two, so I obviously read it. Now in this book, we focus on her social studies class with Mr. Van Doy. To backtrack to the pre-diary warnings, I did notice this. And let's not forget what Curiosity did to that cat. Um, actually ask Isabella about that one, I dare you. I think Isabella truly gets more evil with every book. Like, her thing this time around was taking advantage of the fact that Jamie's Aunt Carol now works in the office, so when she gets in trouble now, there's like little to no punishment. Jamie's Aunt Carol gets the job because Isabella tattled on Jamie for gluing a picture in her hair like during art class when they were working on their new collage project. So she's in Principal Devin's office or he's the assistant principal actually and she notices that he no longer has his like 
thick glasses that he would usually sport. This is because he got eye surgery, so he lets Jamie try on his thick glasses, but when one of the old mean office ladies like walks in, Jamie has to see her ugliness all up close and personal unexpectedly, and it startles her so bad she lets out a scream, which scares the old mean office lady, sending her into a counter, knocking over the big bowl of butterscotch candies, which caused her to slip and fall. Now because of this, he ultimately forgets about punishing Jamie, and Isabel ends up apologizing to Jamie about it, although it still wasn't enough for her because she ends up retelling on Jamie for the same thing about two or three times so that she'll get punished. She just is very serious about getting even with others. That'll make a lot more sense later. So the second time she gets called in about what she did um, to Isabella, this time Jamie sees Angeline trying on the glasses. So I just walked right into assistant principal Devin's office only to see the unmistakably glorious back of Angeline's flawless blonde head. For a moment, I found myself fantasizing about all the terrific punishments Angeline might be getting, but suddenly she turned around, and she was wearing Assistant Principal Devon's old glasses, which magnified the pure beauty in her eyes the exact same color as a blue popsicle about a jillion million times. And this time I screamed a little because pure beauty was just never meant to be magnified that much either. My scream made her scream, and I stumbled backward into the same counter that took out the mean old office lady. As a self-trained ballerina, I would have easily recovered, except for these new shoes shoes are a little slippery on the bottom, so I took it right to the head. Next thing I knew, they had given me the small cold thing to put on my head. The small cold thing is the absolute highest form of medical treatment they can give you at school. It's practically their version of a heart transplant. Shortly after this, they called Jamie's mom to come get her, but her aunt Carol ended up coming instead since she's now staying with their fam Jamie's family. Well, she is family. She's staying at Jamie's mom's house, and Jamie's mom is her sister. She had actually just arrived like a day or two ago. Also, I should clarify, this is a different aunt than the one from the first book. Um, aunt Carol is single with no kids. Also, let me know what your equivalent um, to the small cold thing was as a kid at your middle or elementary school because I went to a Montessori school from kindergarten to eighth grade and they would give us just this sponge in a bag like that was kept in this little like freezer of this mini fridge in the office and half the time they would l already be melted when you would get it and the baggie would just have water in it or it would quickly melt after you got it fresh out of the freezer. I'm sorry, what is a sponge supposed to fix for me? I got hit in the head with a kickball while learning crochet at recess once in like first or second grade, which is probably why I have this like irrational fear of like balls hitting me in the head. And all they did was just give me a sponge in a bag and send me back to class. Okay, side tangent, but back to Aunt Carol. Basically this interaction at the school, I think is what got her the job because in Jamie's words, assistant principal Devins and Aunt Carol were not weeping and wringing their heads the way she expected to be wept and wrung over. The next day though, she tells Jamie she got offered the job that opened up, which um, I forgot to say is because the mean old office lady that fell is retiring and she ended up breaking her hip from the fall. At first, Jamie is horrified um, at this news because, I don't know, it's kind of everyone's worst fear to have a family member working at their school. Although, I remember being jealous because, like, those kids got access to, like, the microwave in the break room for their lunch at school, and I was just stuck using a thermos. But of course, Isabella retold on her again when she realized Jamie never got punished, but this time Jamie went to the office and she was like absolutely shocked to no longer see the mean, bitter old office ladies she once knew. In fact, the office ladies were smiling and there was even some music playing. Um, right where those dreadful butterscotch candies were, there were these like new mini chocolate bars. And then Aunt Carol pointed out Jamie and said that she was her niece and they all smiled and waved at Jamie for once. Things only really continued to get better from here though. Assistant Principal Devins came out of his office and showed me Isabella's newest memo. Your aunt has told me about your friend Isabella. She's a retailer. I figure she's gonna keep retelling until you get punished. So how about this? He dropped her note on the floor. How about you pick that up and toss it in the wastebasket? Then you can tell her that I made you clean up the office. And this continued when Jamie accidentally slipped in the lunchroom and ran directly into Miss Brentford, who immediately sent her to the office. Um, I don't know why, because that was obviously an accident but Aunt Carol immediately took the note and threw it away. So after this point, Isabella started to kind of like abuse this power when she found out about it. Jamie, in her defense, thought that she shouldn't tell Isabella, but you know, she don't want to hide something from her best friend. But the main plot of this book is Aunt Carol has been going on some dates and Jamie wants to sleep on the couch so she can fake sleep and eavesdrop on her mom and aunt 
Carol's conversations to find out who like she's going on these dates with. But she can only do that if Stinker farts in her room, stinking it up. Um, so she keeps feeding him like baked beans, which proves to be unsuccessful. But moving on, here's where things really start to go down. Um, let me just read this next entry for some context. Dear Dumb Diary, Miss Anderson was late for art class today. She looked over our collages today, but she hardly noticed any of the details. In fact, all Miss Anderson really wanted was to get us on to our next assignment, which was her weirdest one in quite some time, to make a Valentine's card. Um, but don't put anybody's name on it. It's not even close to Valentine's Day, mind you. And later the same day, Jamie ends up getting sent to the office again, um, because she tells Mr. Van Doy his ass is fat? Anyway, she gets sent to the office and her Aunt Carol is actually nowhere to be seen, which kind of makes her a little nervous. However, she's surprised to see that Miss Anderson, who Jamie notices seems unhappy, direct Jamie to Mr. Devon's office saying, he's all yours. Um, luckily, he doesn't care too much. It actually laughs about the interaction that Jamie had with her teacher, just says to like choose her words more wisely next time. But as he threw that note in the trash, you know what Jamie spots? Her Valentine, the one she made in Miss Anderson's class. And she had written um, how about lunch on it, trying to ask out assistant principal Devon to lunch? I'm guessing he said no, and that's why she seemed angry, but here's the weird part. Miss Anderson and assistant principal Devins have worked together for years. Why would she give him a valentine all of a sudden? Why would he say no? Anyway, this whole time Aunt Carol has been planning a get-together party at Jamie's house, and the day has finally arrived, so Jamie is a little freaked out to see how many of her teachers are just showing up at this thing at her house. But right when assistant principal Devins walks in, it's very clear as day um, to Jamie what's going on and who Aunt Carol has been dating when the pair shares a kiss. Right after this, Mrs. Brentford and Isabella come strolling in and Isabella ended up taking Jamie into the bathroom to kind of fill her in. Isabella finally got detention yesterday uh, for all of her shenanigans um, and Isabella said it only took a few minutes in the office before she could tell that Angeline had not been talking about Miss Anderson. She had been talking about my Aunt Carol. Isabella said it was completely obvious that Aunt Carol and, and Assistant Principal Devin really liked each other, which explains the big smooch and that she overheard Aunt Carol talking about how special this party was going to be for her and how she wished Miss Anderson wasn't going to be there. And then Isabella brings up an actual good point. Miss Anderson basically only was interested in seeing Assistant Principal Devins now, despite them working together for years, because Aunt Carol liked him, which Jamie herself was questioning earlier when she saw the Valentine in the trash. But Isabel also confessed that she's just been getting in trouble so she could go to the office and have the mini chocolate candy bars in the waiting room. As soon as she realized Miss Anderson could get in the way of this, she just couldn't let it happen. So remember earlier with her retelling and retelling? Well, getting even matters to her. And when Miss Anderson decided to reject her idea in art class in favor of Angeline's collage idea, she needed to get even for that. So today after school, she ran out to the parking lot, found Miss Anderson's car, let out one of the tires air so she couldn't make it to the party. But when she got there, Mrs. Brentford was already letting the air out of the tire herself. Why would she do such a thing? Well, multiple times um, in the mornings, like Mrs. Brentford is like the outside monitor making sure kids get into school safely. They had stopped to talk a lot and ended up becoming friends, I guess. Mrs. Brentford had done this out of love for her friend, aka Aunt Carol. So in that moment, they kind of just enjoyed this crime together. So in the end, Mrs. Brentford offered to give Isabella a ride to Jamie's house. After they talked it out in the bathroom, aka where Isabella was filling Jamie in, they saw Angeline walking into the house with her hands also like really dirty. So assistant principal Devins asked her where she was and she said she was helping Miss Anderson out with a flat tire on her car, but ended up being unsuccessful because she lost the nuts. Shortly after this, the lovely couple announced that they were actually getting engaged, which I'm not gonna lie, caught me off guard a little. These books happened in the span of like 30 days or so. So like, damn. But we find out something even more shocking when Angeline says the words, congratulations, Uncle Dan. <laughs> Uncle Dan? That's right, guys. Angeline is assistant principal Devon's niece. Just then, as everyone's celebrating this news, Stinker finally decides to let loose his fart that's been brewing for the past three weeks. So now everyone has to evacuate the house because it smells so bad. So everyone evacuates the house and um, then they hear this kind of like loud laugh, the kind of laugh that, you know, 
makes you want to laugh too. And it turns out it was coming from none other than Mr. Vandoy, the teacher that never smiles. Shortly after this, Jamie brings up Angeline helping Miss Anderson being a lousy thing for her to do. But you know, Aunt Carol just laughs. Jamie, the other day I was over at Dan's house and Angeline changed the oil for me in my car. The girl knows her way around a wrench. If Angeline lost the nuts, she lost them on purpose. So once again, Angeline actually helped out Jamie and did her a favor, or helped out her Aunt Carol, should I say. Isabella and Miss Brentford had slowed Miss Anderson down, but Angeline must have seen her changing the tire and knew she'd make it there still and spoil this moment for um, Jamie's Aunt Carol. So Angeline pretended to help. You know, she lost the nuts on purpose. She did it because she knows that assistant principal Devins and Aunt Carol truly belong together. She wasn't mad the other day that Miss Anderson had chosen my Valentine. She was mad that Miss Anderson was butting in. Eventually Miss Anderson did stop by, but she got a ride from this tow truck guy that came to help her with her car trouble. And she ended up like talking and laughing with the happy couple like nothing had ever happened. Oh, it's also at this moment that I want to say, did we just forget about Mr. Prince? Or were they never even dating? Like, why was she suddenly trying to get with Dan when, when she was like supposedly dating that guy? Unless they broke up in between that book and this one. That was like the first question that came to mind when like she was trying to butt into this relationship. But anyway, that's pretty much it for this story. But I do want to finish it off with this very last quote because it kind of ties in everything pretty well. It was Mr. Van Doy that made me ask the question, can adults become human? And it was Mr. Van Doy that helped me answer it. Here tonight at my house, everybody was a human. There were no adults. Come on, can we, can we have a round of applause? The title of our next book is The Problem With Here Is It's Where I'm From, which firstly, can we talk about the cover of this one? Like graphic design is their passion. I'm obsessed. Now I haven't really talked about the covers of the other books all that much that we've covered so far, um, no pun intended, besides like briefly mentioning what I remember as a kid. However, I'm highlighting this one because it's an obvious standout amongst the like simple colored backgrounds we were so used to seeing. So this book starts off introducing the project that Jamie has been assigned through the course of this book by her English teacher, Mr. Evans. This time he wants them to explore people and their cultures through different things they write. So Jamie ends up pairing up with Angeline to do their project on graffiti. We also find out the main plot, um, which is basically something went stinkfully wrong in Jamie's words with the like heating and ventilation air over at another middle school. So since it's probably gonna take a few weeks to like fix, they're gonna be bussing other schools I mean, busting other kids from nearby schools. Basically, some kids from um, that school campus are going to be coming to Jamie's school to learn while their school ventilation is being fixed. An update on the last book, Aunt Carol is planning the wedding and could not seem more stressed about it, frankly. Like, Jamie is secretly manifesting a divorce because she's technically related to Angeline. Anyway, we got the big news about the kids from another school. Um, coming to Jamie's school on a Friday and that Monday was when they started attending So back in Mr. Evans class, he has them do like haiku poems and this is where we meet Colette for the first time Jamie is convinced that she's French because Colette is like a French name I don't know if that's actually true, but Jamie's been obsessed with accents this whole book Jamie's also convinced that Colette is like prettier than Angeline and of course She doesn't have the advantage of blonde hair on her side. She has like dark black hair like mine also, her name, every time it's mentioned, is written in this like bold cursive type font, which was honestly really cool to me and like makes it stand out more, which I think is the purpose. She seemed to really get along with Isabel because they both have older brothers and know about what it's like to get back at them. Speaking of Isabel, she keeps kind of stressing out like Aunt Carol more about the wedding, telling her stuff like wedding cakes are no longer in. I thought it was pretty helpful, but Aunt Carol acted all mad. Like it was Isabel's fault that the fashion world has lost interest in cake. Not exactly a newsflash. One look at those fashion models and I could have told you that they had tragically lost interest in cake a long time ago. Jamie! Now the same time, this is all happening at Macro Middle School, um, they're supposed to have like one of those polls for like most blank um, and one of the categories is most pretty which Angeline always wins. That'll be important later which is why I'm mentioning it but um, for their project Angeline got permission from probably her uncle to uh, go take pictures of 
the like graffiti in the boys bathroom on a Saturday and the best drawing in the whole bathroom was of Angeline which makes Jamie you know obviously upset but not even two seconds later Isabel screamed don't ask me why she's here I already asked myself the same question she was spending the night um the night before and this was kind of an unexpected plan for Jamie so I think that's why she tagged along but the girls followed the scream and there it was on one of the stalls written in clear bold green marker it said vote Jamie Kelly for prettiest I didn't even know what to say but Isabella did she said I guess maybe not everyone thinks you're the prettiest girl in the world huh Angeline then on Monday Angeline wanted to do the girls bathroom which literally had no graffiti except a small drawing of a bald guy peeking over a wall but had been mostly scrubbed off a picture of Mrs. Bruntford that was drawn by Isabella a month ago and had already been pointed out to Jamie and another vote Jamie Kelly for prettiest exactly like the first one that was left in the boys bathroom since there wasn't much um in the girls bathroom they went to ask Jamie's aunt Carol if they could check the teacher's bathroom but when Jamie um asks she says no <laughs> but then Angeline asked the same thing and she says yes it didn't matter that much anyway because like they didn't find any real graffiti except a heart that had the initials DD and VA which Isabella who's um still there for some reason connected the dots pretty quickly for what it stood for dan devins and valerie anderson <gasps> aka the art teacher she's the one that previously tried to steal dan away from jamie's aunt carol and of course isabel told aunt carol and then later they saw the couple like whisper yelling at each other as for the voting polls um isabella and jamie finally got the okay from aunt carol to kind of be in charge of it they wanted to do this because of how stressed she was with wedding planning and it didn't seem like she had time really so isabella has practically been hogging like all of the work um are we surprised she comes over to spend the night and still won't dare to share the voting poll results with jamie despite the fact that this was supposed to be a group effort. Now, remember when I mentioned um, Isabella stressing Aunt Carol out about her wedding? Well, I was right. Um, it was on purpose. Isabella was still refusing to share the voting results with me by afternoon, and when I pointed out the project was supposed to go to Aunt Carol, who was my aunt, she said that we would have never gotten our hands on them if it hadn't been for the things Isabella had done. And then Isabella admitted to what she had done. I'm telling you, it seems like Isabella is always admitting something, although it's beginning to sound a lot more like bragging and less like a confession every time. It turns out Isabella had been freaking Aunt Carol out about the wedding since she had found out that she had been potentially given the responsibility for voting. Isabella got her all frazzled about the schedule and the wedding and her weight and made up stuff about the wedding pies and like bridal clogs and she said that she was the one who had faked the little heart graffiti on the teacher's bathroom so the next day isabella shows jamie this photo uh, from the day they took the pictures in the boys bathroom where you can see angeline in the background with a pen in her pocket which makes me wonder you know angeline had written the vote for jamie kelly for prettiest um graffiti in the boys bathroom and the girls bathroom but also Isabella could have been framing her so I wasn't really sure yet also she finally revealed the results for the prettiest poll and it was Angeline winning at 100 votes Colette at 90 and Jamie at 15 if it hadn't been for Angeline's campaigning if it hadn't been for the graffiti Isabella said if it hadn't been for Angeline showing the pictures of the graffiti around you wouldn't have picked up those 15 votes and Colette would have won so for context on Friday in English class Colette said something nice to the class and at that moment like the class was giving her so much attention so Angeline said she wanted to share an update on the graffiti project which mind you wasn't due soon or anything but anyways uh, fast forward a couple days by Tuesday of the next school week the kids from the other campus like went back to their old school um, and then on Thursday Aunt Carol wanted Angeline Jamie and Isabella to drop off some student files at the Wode Middle School or the Wode House Middle School which is what it's called I just didn't use the name this was mostly because she wanted the three of them to become close friends but also she was having trouble working um, in her <sighs> What in bridal clogs? I really should have said something. Jamie said something! <laughs> anyway, um, they get to the school and not even a few steps into the doors, Isabella brings up the whole voting for Jamie Kelly graffiti. Um, remember the photo of her having the pen in her pocket? Okay, I did it, Angeline said quietly, but I've washed it all off already. It was clear to me that Colette would have beaten me any other way. I mean, she's gorgeous, but even so, I knew I could get enough votes for Jamie to split the vote. And of course, she'd take the votes from Colette, not from me, because those people don't really know Colette. Her position as prettiest is less stable than mine, because I win it every year. Sometimes I believe people don't really think it through. They probably just automatically vote for me 
me because they're used to voting for me. You know, it's not like the prettiest is an accomplishment at all, Angeline said. It's just how you look. Being pretty is the same thing as being ugly. It's just something you can't really help. Jamie always wins most artistic, and you always win most clever. Those are real things. Prettiest is so lame, but no one ever considers me for anything else. I wasn't just about to lose my one lame category. After this, they go to the cafeteria and they find Colette, um, assuming that she had been popular like Angeline. They ask a kid, and he immediately says, oh, do you mean Collie? She looked very different from when they had last seen her previously. Isabel also cracked this case. It was... Colette, or Collie, who had stunk out her own school's ventilation system. Her last day at Macro Middle School, she said something that stuck out to me, actually. Isabella started talking about how she could use a little vacation and how she wished there was a way to close the school for a few weeks, and Colette said, that's actually pretty easy to do. And Isabella looked at Colette right in the eyes and then just stood up and walked out of the lunchroom and hardly talked the rest of the day. Isabella suspected it was because she didn't want to do the voting polls at her school because of like the whole like her having to attend macro middle school temporarily she got included in their voting polls instead but earlier in the book we hear the story uh, of a girl whose friend made her laugh at lunch causing spaghetti to shoot out of her nose and then the teachers were afraid it was like an intestine or vein or something so the school nurse had to come down to the lunchroom and remove it herself while the whole school basically watched well guess what that girl was Colette. Another story we heard was a girl who fell asleep with a permanent marker in her mouth, causing there to be a blue spot on her mouth that wouldn't come off. And you know who that girl was? Colette. She was up crying all night and was so tired the next day that she fell asleep in class with a permanent marker in her mouth. Basically, um, nothing was really wrong with Wodehouse as a school, but because of a lot of little things like that, she has no friends, aka in fact, there's nothing wrong here, except it's where I'm from. The next day was Friday, so Isabella finally got to reveal the voting poll results, and it turns out Sally won most clever, not Colette, not Isabella. Margaret won most artistic instead of Jamie like usual. Apparently Jamie did win, but she couldn't win two categories at once, obviously. And apparently she almost won most funniest too. And finally for best friends, it was Jamie, Isabella, and Angeline. And then Colette ended up winning um, the prettiest, even though Angeline was the actual winner. Just then when um, Aunt Carol came out of her office, she was so excited about the results, um, but she had even bigger news for the girls. She wanted the three of them to actually be bridesmaids in her wedding and bought them all clogs too. <laughs> Isabella ended up offering um, to make them break off their engagement, saying she could get it done in about a week but shockingly Jamie said no and that's basically the story I'm gonna similarly like I did with the last book um, read this email that the book ends off with it's from Colette to Jamie dear Jamie I told the principal what I did with the cat food and why and I'm getting punished but they're going easy on me because I confess the prettiest award I won at your school made a big difference for me here I didn't eat lunch alone today and nobody called me Collie all day mackerel middle school is the best school in the world you guys are super nice love Colette p.s you'll like this. Today at lunch, one of my friends told me that she heard about this girl at some other school who was going around talking like she had a speech impediment or something. And then when the principal found out, he made her wear wooden clogs. Can you believe it? So yes, guys, Jamie is now their um, girl at some other school. Remember her obsession with accents that I briefly touched on? Well, she's been doing this one um, that she thought was like an Italian accent, but it really just sounded silly. And I guess it was based off Isabella's grandma, but it turns out she's not Italian. She just talks the way she does because, you know, her dentures are broken. And then all three girls came to the conclusion that that's probably why Jamie almost won for um, the funniest category because she's been doing this accent around school at random times recently. But never underestimate your own dumbness. Our next book, aka book seven, is called Never Underestimate Your Dumbness. And from this point on, I haven't read any of these books, or at least that's my theory. I know I haven't read book eight and above for sure because I didn't even know that like stink ed existed, but okay, that's jumping ahead of ourselves. Starting off, um, within the first seven pages, we are reminded of the impact Isabella had on Aunt Carol's wedding, which is also happening in a month. But more importantly, I don't know how Jamie hasn't even said anything yet. Oh wait, we do. It's hard not to blame Angeline for all this, since she is somebody other than myself. But it's kind of Isabel's doing, since she tricked Aunt Carol into thinking brown poofy dresses and clogs were the coolest things you could accessorize your wedding with. But it's very hard for me to blame Isabella for anything, even when someone shows me photographic evidence. And besides, Angeline is much prettier, therefore, 
blame malicious. My mom took this photo. She says Isabella pushed me into the lake, but I think she was trying to catch me. Also, Stinker ate a jar of glitter. <laughs> Jamie was using it to make posters for the upcoming um, school dance that Margaret is the committee of for some reason. So of course she asked Jamie, because she's kind of known for her skills with uh, glitter. I mean, just think of Miss Anderson's Valentine. But rightfully so, he started acting weird, so they took Stinker to the vet to make sure he was okay, and luckily he was. Also, Isabella came along because she really wants a puppy. But like, she can't have one due to her bad track record with pets. I know, I know. Don't bring up the turtle again is what you're thinking. Well, I don't have to. Take a look at this chart. Bobo is currently running away, but only gets a few inches a day. He's alive? Is this a whole new turtle? Like, we're leaving out a lot of details here. If so, I have so many questions, starting with why would she be allowed to get another one? Or is this a continuity error type situation? Let me be free of total drama tropes. But I guess Isabella truly gets her karma for suggesting those clogs for Aunt Carol's wedding, because when she, Angeline, and Jamie meet at Jamie's house for the bridesmaid fashion show, she falls down the stairs and suddenly everyone starts like, coddling her like she's a little baby and feeding her ice cream. Well, guess what guys? Um, it was all a lie. Who was surprised? She purposely threw herself down the stairs, which turns out, um, is another one of the tricks that she's learned. Um, she's mastered in order to get her mean older brothers in trouble. So once Isabella faked a good enough recovery, they tried on the bridesmaid dresses and they were so ugly, but surprisingly, looked amazing on Isabella. So when Isabella refused to fall again, Jamie attempted to push her down the stairs, but I guess Isabella's instincts kicked in from her older brother's tactics, so she moved out of the way, sending Jamie bouncing down the stairs head first. Anyway, the Dan, Aunt Carol, and Miss Anderson saga continues when Jamie leaves some earrings um, in Aunt Carol's office because she thought she left them at her house during the bridesmaid fashion show, but Aunt Carol assumes that they're Miss Anderson's, so Dan and Carol show up at her classroom and basically start interrogating her? I absolutely agree that she was in the wrong previously, but this kind of made me like mad. Like, it's so unprofessional. So obviously Jamie the next day goes to tell her Aunt Carol, hey, I left those there, this is a misunderstanding. And guess what? Angeline had already confessed that she left the earrings. So because Aunt Carol had already blown up at Miss Anderson, she's being punished by not being allowed to go to the dance. Uh? Isabella had a pretty good theory. She thinks that's because Angeline is super dumb. Isabella is probably right, she almost always is. So I think back on all the things I've seen Angeline do, and one thing they have in common is that they're all dumb. But the dumbest thing she's ever done is taking the blame when she didn't actually drop a doggy deuce on my aunt's desk. Which, by the way, um, Angeline and Jamie got asked by Hudson to go get tacos after the dance. Jamie was a little stressed about this plan because she agreed to it while her and Isabella were in a fight and they made up right afterwards. Hudson actually said specifically that Isabella couldn't come, so Jamie hasn't even told her yet. And then when the three of them um, want to get new shoes to replace the clogs, Isabella was like talking to Angeline like really slow, which made her upset. And then they dropped Angeline off at home and Isabella made this comment. Later when we dropped Angeline off at home, she reminded us to make sure to wear the shoes around to get used to them. And Isabella told her that that was a good idea. But if you're going to walk around in the yard, be careful not to step in any earrings. Which was totally a stupid thing to say. As we were pulling away, I looked back and saw Angeline putting it all together in her head. I told Isabella that Angeline is not as dumb as we hope she'll look one day. Isabella says not to worry about it because it wasn't me who said it. Angeline must think Isabella left the doggy do on Aunt Carol's desk. Honestly, I feel really bad for Angeline here. And in fact, as you read more and more of these books, you slowly start to realize Angeline is not the bad guy here. The next day, Jamie is home trying to figure out um, what to put in her diorama project, and she compares this Barbie to Angeline, and well, I'm just gonna go ahead and read this entry for context. The Barbie reminded me a little of Angeline, and I found myself acting out a little scene in which she's watching me and Hudson drive away for tacos, and she's crying and crying because she doesn't even get to go to the dance. I suddenly realized something. I love live theater. What? <laughs> like, why did we just do a 180? Angeline is supposed to be your friend now. I also realized that it wasn't Angeline's fault that she was going to feel bad. It was Isabella's fault for cluing her in. 
and it was Hudson's fault for asking us to taco eating and not Isabella, and it was America's fault for encouraging middle schools to have dances. It amazes me sometimes how anybody could ever think anything was my fault. You know, I really aspire to be this delusional one day. Also, when Jamie and her mom are talking um, about her having another cousin in the future, which Jamie assumes she means Angeline, but her mom meant Dan if like Dan and Carol have kids one day. Anyway, her mom actually explained that Angeline and Jamie won't be cousins. In fact, they won't be related at all, which of course is like the best news Jamie's ever received in her entire life. The next day though, Jamie gets sent on an errand to see if Mrs. Palmer has any mail, and when she gets to the office, she actually hears Dan and Carol shouting, and when Aunt Carol came out of his office, um, you could tell she had been crying a little bit. Ever since they've announced this engagement, they truly seemed like unhappy to me. To be fair, it's not a crazy assumption because they got engaged after knowing each other for like three or four weeks. But anyway, they have a rehearsal dinner earlier than expected because they can't do it the night before because Dan has to chaperone the middle school dance, which is the day before the wedding. They both work at the school. I can only ask myself why they would do that to themselves. Anyway, Jamie ends up having this dream about, um, Angeline and decides to convince Dan to let her attend the dance again. It's here, um, and now, 125 pages into this book, I finally realized the earrings weren't actually earrings, but poop, because Stinker had eaten all that glitter, and Jamie had just mistaken his poop for glitter earrings that Angeline had also worn. I mean, the whole reason they think it is Miss Anderson is because they look similar to her earrings. How insulting is that? Anyway, he says Jamie should have just told him the truth immediately, but Jamie said that the truth is the truth even if it's a couple days later, in which he says that's the dumbest thing he's ever heard. Honestly, I had agree with him if it wasn't for the fact that Jamie had already tried to tell her aunt the truth when it first happened and she thought she was lying because Angeline had already confessed. Anyway, he agreed to let Angeline attend the dance and I love how the next entry starts with, I just got back from the dance, where should I start? Not that every entry isn't like that, but this just reminded me that this really is her diary. Like, maybe I shouldn't be so judgmental after all. First of all, Angeline thanked me for telling Uncle Assistant Principal Devon the truth. Then she laughed at me for being dumb enough to mistake Stinker's creation for earrings. I pointed out how dumb it was for her to take the blame for something she didn't do, and she said she just did it so Aunt Carol and, um, Uncle Dan would stop fussing over it. She said she totally knew I had done it, but she didn't really care. She just wanted to make it stop. I guess she's not that dumb after all. Oh, really, Jamie? I'm gonna let it go. Or not. Literally a page later, it says, but here's how dumb Angelina is. She just starts dancing and she's not doing it with anybody in particular. She just dances in every direction and she does it like nobody's watching. One minute she's dancing with Mike Pinsetti and the next she's dancing with Margaret, who's surprisingly a good dancer and barely ape-like. It's so weird how easily dumbness comes to Angeline. It turns out Jamie's the kid that like doesn't actually dance at the school dance and just kind of stands around. It doesn't surprise me since like her and Isabel had practiced their standing techniques to ensure they wouldn't look stupid. Honestly, being the first people to start a dance at a dance is humiliating. I just graduated high school in June and our last dance that we had, um, literally nobody was dancing. So me and this like big group of people had to be the ones to start dancing to get everyone else like to finally dance but it was embarrassing at the same time because like all the eyes are kind of on you anyway um jamie felt too bad to ditch isabella for tacos with hudson the guilt was like eating her away the whole dance so she ended up not going i know i knew you wouldn't ditch isabel it was mean of hudson to say isabel couldn't come and i'm not going either but then it turns out isabel knew the whole time so she asked why they aren't going anymore which should mean she knows hudson invited them but specifically isabella couldn't come well plot twist that's right isabella said that's exactly what I told him two weeks ago because my mom wouldn't let me go. When Hudson said Isabella couldn't go, he meant literally like she couldn't go because basically, um when Aunt Carol like drove Isabella home a couple weeks ago, she told Isabella's mom about the whole falling down the stairs, and of course Isabella's mom, you know knows that this is a trick of Isabella's, so she got in trouble, so that's why she couldn't go. That fall may have fooled your family, Jamie, but the last time I successfully fooled my mom with that one, I was four. She was mad that I did it at your house. She almost said I couldn't go to the dance either, but she's totally not immune for my fake crying yet, so here I am. But when I told her that Hudson asked me to go to tacos after, she said I couldn't go as a punishment. Hudson asked me before he asked you to. I told him I couldn't go. Jamie, I would have told you, but we were fighting that day, and it just hasn't come up since. So yeah, basically, they missed out on that for nothing, but I mean, I guess it's fine because Jamie was so stressed on looking cute while eating a taco in front of Hudson anyways. Also, things worked out great with the wedding in the end. Um, 
Dan ended up leaving the bridesmaid dresses in his unlocked car after they were altered and somebody stole them. So that meant they got to wear the other dresses they got as a gift for the rehearsal dinner. They got gifted the dresses instead of like jewelry or something since the incident with the poop earrings. That someone turned out to be the groom, but you didn't hear it from me. And that's basically it. Um, oh, also Jamie danced the way Angeline danced at the school dance and admitted it was actually a good time for her. Now, ironically, the assignment Jamie completes over the course of this book is a diary. This is for Mr. Evans' English class, and they have to keep it for around three weeks. Now, you'd probably think, this is right up Jamie's alley, but, but these diaries will be read by everyone. Evans explained that old Mrs. Penny, the ancient media specialist or librarian, is going to type up all our diary entries and put them in the library where anyone can just walk in and check them out. This is a clear violation of sacred secrecy of diaries. Honestly, I have to agree with her here because why are they putting the diaries in the library of all places? Like, if this doesn't seem abnormal, correct me um, in the comments because I did go to a Montessori school and my experience is kind of different. So Jamie ended up blurting out that you can't just let people read our diaries. Diaries are private. And when that comment clearly made Mr. Evans kind of upset, Isabella said, Jamie, since you know so much about diaries, maybe you should just help old Mrs. Penny out with the project. Normally, I would have been mad that she had offered me up that way, but she probably spared me from something so much worse. What would I do without her? What is even so much worse? Because your aunt literally works in the front office and is married to the assistant principal. Anyway, it's after this that Mr. Evans um, reveals the entries will be anonymous since they're being published. If it's something personal, you can use fake names and such. So Jamie breaks down to us her tactic for the whole new assignment. She's not going to stop her important regular diary entries, but instead will write some fake pages and then at the end of three weeks she'll just tear those out and turn them in. To be sure she doesn't tear out the wrong ones, she's going to make the assignment pages look drastically different. The cool thing about this is we get to see her fake entries as well as her real ones for this book and they are written in this like cursive-y font with more of a stick figure esque um, drawing art style. Also Stinker and Sticky Buns had puppies and Sticky Buns is Angeline's dog she adopted in the last book. We found out this at the beginning when they took Stinker to the vet for eating the jar of glitter. I just didn't mention it because it wasn't important. While Jamie is at um, Angeline's house to help naming the puppies, Angeline offers to do her hair, which we can remember how that went last time. But this time it actually happens and Jamie is so happy and excited she could barely write a readable diary entry. It's so weird because at the same time throughout this book she's talking like more shit on Angeline than ever. Normally, I would never consider accepting an invitation to Angeline's house out of concern that she would be there. But puppies can make people do crazy things, so I went. Angeline had been sitting down next to me in the cafeteria more often lately, and I think that's because we're family. Not because her uncle, um, assistant principal Devins, married my Aunt Carol. No, because my dog Stinker and her dog Sticky Buns had puppies together, which makes them married in dog world. This made Sticky Buns get all nervous, and I heard Angeline laugh harder than I've ever heard her laugh. Just for a second, it almost sounded human. I actually started laughing myself. I believe this is purely the result of inhaling concentrated puppy fumes, which can make people laugh and create aww sounds against their will. It's not like Angeline and I have anything in common now. The more these books I read, the more I just feel bad for Angeline. I don't think Jamie's inherently a bad person. I actually think she's a better person morally than Greg Heffley or even Nikki Maxwell. Especially when like Angeline showed up that same weekend on Sunday to do homework with Jamie even though she'd already done all her homework. Usually her and Isabella do it together but she was like getting on her nerves kind of about her new puppy from Sticky Buns Litter but the puppies weren't ready to leave their mom yet. It turns out Jamie didn't invite her though. It was Isabella's attempt to steal one of the puppies, but her disguise didn't work because Angeline's mom knew Jamie had a new hairdo. Jamie's like obsessed with it, like at first, excitingly showing it off at school and, you know, taking note of Hudson noticing it. But when the diary entries are due soon, um, she reads Hudson's like entries that are clearly talking about her and she realizes like this hair isn't her. And she comes to the conclusion actually that Angeline must have been like plotting this all along. But for once, Isabella had some common sense when Jamie called her to tell her this revelation and she said none of that made sense. So Jamie went again to Angeline's house for like the third time during this book so Isabella could 
at least pick one of the puppies she wanted um, to shut her up about it. But Angeline stepped on a puppy toy and got scared it was a puppy and like toppled over. And the girls just had to leave without Isabella even picking her puppy because like Angeline was like crying and stuff. It kind of even shocked Jamie that Isabella was so calm, but you know, she thinks that maybe she actually did feel bad for Angeline for once. Anyway, it's Friday and the project was due um, and Aunt Carol called Jamie down to the office and had Jamie turn in Angeline's report for her because she hurt her ankle. Then on Monday, um, when she was back at the school, she proceeded to confront her, but like Isabella said, none of that made sense. It turns out the diary entry wasn't Hudson's because it obviously was written too well. And here's what his actual diary entry said. Dear diary, I saw a video game in a magazine. I want to get it. I, on TV, I saw a car. I want someday. I like pizza and I want to have some for dinner. Isabella is the coolest girl that ever lived. Bye. Isabella, I said. Hudson and Isabella. Jamie, you could tell, couldn't you? I mean, anybody could tell, Angeline said. Anybody could tell, Isabella echoed. Not like I care. He's a dope. If you read my diary, you would have known that. Not that much of a plot twist to me either because like one or two books ago, he asked Isabella to tacos after the dance before he even asked Angeline or Jamie. Jamie also accused Angeline of lying about like not being able to come up with names for the puppies, which doesn't even make sense either. All that based off her dog, Sticky Buns, having a cute name. As we also found out in the last book, she's a rescue dog and she came with that name. We know how Angeline loves her charities. The next day at lunch, we find find out from Isabella what happened though at the end of their exchange or why she dashed off to the library mid-confrontation. It wasn't because of like guilt or anything. It turns out the diary that Aunt Carol had given to Jamie to turn in that Angeline's mom had dropped off was her real diary. Jamie told her about how she was having a fake diary plus her real one at the same time and Angeline, funny enough, was doing the same thing. So her mom mistook her real one for her assignment. So Angeline was terrified that Jamie had actually read it. Jamie hadn't read it but you know who had read some of it? Isabella. Jamie practically begged on her hands and knees for Isabella to break the breach of privacy, which was a boundary Jamie had practically set up herself. I mean, all the pre-diary warnings we've discussed. But she ended up convincing her to spill the beans, and for starters, Angeline never hurt her ankle. She faked it. And she learned by watching Isabella fake various injuries, which is a tactic Isabella's learned because of her older brothers. Turns out she did it because she suspected Isabella was going to choose the puppy she wanted to keep, and this puzzled Jamie. Like, what difference could that make? Well, um, it's what I've been saying all along. Angeline considered is Jamie a friend and she cares about both Jamie and Isabella. She even wrote she'd consider them sisters. And then Isabella said something I thought I'd never hear her say. I think maybe Angeline isn't a total turd, Jamie. Anybody who fakes an injury like that can't be all bad. After this, Jamie only really had one last question left to be answered. As we all know, Jamie had like helped type the diary entries and you know, Mrs. Penny had pointed out one person in particulars at the top of the stack, which is what made her think it was Hudson's. Turns out she pointed it out because it was her dad's diary assignment from when he was a kid and she thought, you know, she'd think it was cool to see, I guess. But to close off the story, we have a pretty wholesome ending. Angeline, Aunt Carol, and Isabel all stop by with the puppies. Um, they're ready to leave their mom, and they each choose, you know, one of their own to keep. Although, Jamie had literally been begging to have one, and her mother finally caved in because of Aunt Carol. All that were left were Dingle Dongle and Stinkette, and although the choice seemed obvious, Jamie ended up choosing Stinkette, um, noticing the bond her and Stinker, um, aka her father, had. In a plot twist, it turns out Stinkette was the puppy that Isabella and Angeline had also wanted, but like they knew that there was more of a bond with her and her father. I don't know if I showed a picture of the puppy already, so I'm just gonna say that Stink Ed is the one puppy that resembles Stinker while the rest resemble their mom. But more importantly, this book ends with Jamie reflecting on her thoughts on certain things, especially when it comes to her friendships with Angeline, because things really, you know, seem to be coming together for Jamie at this point in time. I thought Angeline didn't like me, and Isabella hated Angeline, and that all three of us could never be friends together, much less sisters. I can't believe that I used to think I knew everything back then. I can't believe how dumb I was. It's all in my diary. Who knows what to expect though, because the next book is titled, That's What Friends Aren't For. I can only assume the worst based off the pre, you know, diary warning informational page. <laughs> And we get right into it when Jamie talks about what she defines as an automatic friend to describe her friendship with Angeline. She brought this up to Isabella 
who doesn't understand her problem with Angeline. Isabella being the right for once? Uh. It's clear to me that Jamie misses how things were when it was just her and Isabella with the way that she talks about um, the acronym BFF only having two Fs for a reason or how she notices Angeline and Isabella laughing by Angeline's locker one morning because Hudson's trying to secretly look at Isabella. This also ties in with one of the events happening in the course of this book, aka the talent show, where Isabella is considering doing a magic act and realizes Angeline would be perfect to be her assistant, even though Jamie already offered. I just don't want Isabella to do the talent show without me, even though I know it would be perfect for her and Angeline to go and do the talent show together. I mean, it would be totally perfect, just perfectly perfect, so terribly, terribly perfect. It really shouldn't bother me if I'm left out, right? No big deal, right? So what if I'm not in the talent show with my BFF and we don't have our morning locker time? to be mean to people anymore. I can live with that, right? Anyway, the big project that Jamie is also focused on throughout the book is the school art show. If your work is chosen, it gets framed and hung up and they have a party with like refreshments. But Jamie's mostly excited because she's an art kid. Jamie, shortly after this, ends up seeing a band on TV and decides that this is her like ticket to avoid being left out of the talent show. So she convinces Isabella it'd be cooler than a magic act at the end of the day. Luckily, Angeline agrees to the idea, although so none of them can play music or sing, they just decide to lip sync because it will be funny. Shortly after this, to kind of add on to how Jamie is feeling, her and Isabella always partner up for this one specific portrait drawing assignment where basically you partner up with someone and you guys draw each other. And I guess Jamie was in the bathroom and when she came back, Isabella was already like with Angeline. So she had to partner up with T-U-K-W-N-I-F which stands for that ugly kid whose name I forgot. You couldn't remember that whole abbreviation, but not his name. Anyway, um, Jamie ends up having a dream that night where her, Isabella, and Angeline are flowers. And then the fourth one shows up before a weasel ends up eating the fourth and Angeline, which is why, why is this relevant, you may ask? Well, um, with the band needing to have four members anyway, Jamie realizes she doesn't need to just be looking for a fourth band member, but a fourth friend to integrate into their little group. So that way Angeline can split off with that person and Isabella and Jamie can go back to being the peanut butter and jelly in her words. Isabella and Angeline also study over the weekend on Sunday, which is the day Isabella usually comes to Jamie's and they study but ultimately get nothing done. But the next day in math, um, Isabella actually gets a question right for once in math. I understand why Jamie would be jealous, but I actually think it was a good thing for Angeline to step in and help Isabella, especially since like Jamie said herself, the two of them don't get anything done. And and if Isabella fails math, she'll have to do summer school. Also, the class reviewed the portrait art assignment again from the previous week. Usually in all the years that Jamie does this with Isabella, she doesn't like spend time on like her portrait. However, the portrait of Angeline was actually pretty good and it was clear she spent a lot of time drawing it. I really, really wanted to talk to Isabella about this, but how do you even say something like that without sounding like a lunatic? Isabella, I demand that you be my friend much more than you are Angeline's friend. In doing so, you should always draw me better than you draw Angeline, always. And also, I demand that we both forget about the fact that the universe made Angeline an automatic friend and we go back to when I was just on her case all the time, but I can't say that. Simultaneously, this whole time, Jamie has also been interviewing people for potentially becoming the fourth band member and some of them it's like obvious why she rejects but other times she's just being like kind of mean like there was this really nice girl Annika that she rejected I think she, her name only came up once in one of the other books but then there was this girl Emily who Jamie thought was really dumb and she got a maybe and now I'm just lost like I reviewed applications over and over and I can't figure it out I marked Scratchy Vampire Girl as a probably, and I rejected Annika, who I've known for a long time and really like. I'm beginning to think I don't even know what makes people friends anymore. And then when Angeline and Isabella asked who the fourth band member was, um, Jamie didn't know what to say, so she just said Elizabeth, who she actually rejected, so I don't even know why she said that. Shortly after, she mentions Annika and Nadia, which um, Isabella said she'd be fine with either, but then Jamie brings up another girl, Shannon, who I thought was fine, but she was really harsh on for some reason. And the girls agree on Shannon. And then you know what Jamie did? She called Emily um, to tell her that she made the band. Wow, that was a roller coaster. The band only has like two or three rehearsals until the day Jamie turns in her art piece for the art show. She also finds out the art show is canceled in favor of the talent show since more kids would be participating. Jamie was like so upset 
that she couldn't even enjoy like doing the performance anymore and told Isabella that she should just do her magic act with Angeline instead. So yeah, no band ever happened in the talent show and this really upset Isabella and Angeline a lot because the talent show was literally tomorrow, keep in mind. However, Jamie did go to watch since her parents forced her to go. Isabella ended up doing her little magic act, but not with Angeline, with Emily, who with her all her dumbness was just as amazed as the audience every time Isabella did a trick. Then the ugly kid, who I can't even remember the acronym for, um, came on stage and played the piano, but on the front of the piano was Jamie's art piece that she had worked so hard on for the art show. The next act after that was also Angeline. Angeline, which Jamie like debated trying to stop because she brought out a guitar and Jamie thought that she was just going to perform like the lip sync band act they had previously planned alone and then she started talking. The funding for the art show was cut, she said, and we need your help so it can go on next month as planned. Please drop a dollar or whatever you can in the donation buckets by the exit as you leave tonight. Thank you. And maybe that would have raised a buck or two, but she wasn't done. First the smile, the spotlight hit Angeline's gleaming white teeth and blinding ray of toothy beauty blazed by the audience. And then she batted her long eyelashes and they created a breeze that we all felt flutter across our faces. And then when she was up to full output, she tossed her glimmering hair back and forth in slow motion, causing every hand in the auditorium to plunge helplessly into pockets and purses and fork over what added up to be more than 300 bucks, much more than they ever needed to put on the art show. So in a 180 we also find out Angeline knew how to play guitar all along and had been taking lessons for years which is ironic considering they were gonna pretend to play music for their band act. Anyway, um, Jamie ended up thanking Angeline and even giving her a hug. It turns out Isabella and her were mad at first, but then they realized how much art actually means to Jamie. But the next morning, you know who showed up to Jamie's house? Takafanava, I don't know who it is after them. He'd actually came by to give Jamie her art piece back and she even thanked him for making it a part of his act, but he said this was actually Isabella's idea. As Jamie was standing there looking at him though, she kind of like changed her mind about what she was entering into the art show. I was thinking of putting the other one up, I said, the portrait I did of you if that's okay. And then she proceeds to say that she couldn't remember how to spell his name in order to get his name because obviously she's been referring to him as this acronym the whole time. Turns out his name is actually Tucker and Jamie thought to herself um, after he left, I almost couldn't remember why I even called him T-U-W-N-F, I, I don't even think I said it right after all these years. In the end, Jamie solves her Sunday's problem with Isabella coming over on Saturdays instead. That way they still get their one-on-one -on -one time together and hang out like they used to and Angeline can simultaneously help her potentially get out of summer school, which turns out Isabella missed their individual time together too, so communication is always key. Jamie also admits her jealousy towards Angeline, and in her defense, she's so perfectly kind and pleasant and pretty, it'd be hard for a normal person not to despise her. She also admits to the automatic friend thing not being necessarily true, and how she thinks there's actually no such thing as an automatic friend anymore. Also, Jamie asked Isabella about her drawing of Angeline, and it turns out Isabella never tried drawing Jamie because she wanted to watch Jamie draw her, and she even said that Angeline watches Jamie draw too, and that she's really jealous of Jamie's artistic ability. It's all in my our next book is titled The Worst Things in Life Are Free. This is the 10th book and takes place during summer vacation. Now, Jamie immediately starts like making a list of plans she would like to do over the summer in typical middle schooler fashion. And her parents don't really agree to any of them because of expenses. Well, their tune of heart soon changes when Aunt Carol and Uncle Dan actually agree to take Angeline, Isabella, and Jamie to this amusement park called Screamtopia. Like most things though, there was a catch. The girls needed to raise the money, for their admission tickets to the park, but Uncle Dan and Aunt Carol would pay for the total cost of like the hotel so they could stay overnight. Quickly, the girls think of ways they could make some money, starting with a lemonade stand that ultimately fails when Isabella drinks all the lemonade while they're not looking. Then Jamie suggests that they should try babysitting, which got Angeline to admit she sometimes does babysit. I don't know why Jamie is like so surprised about this though, because do we not remember the plastic surgeon kids at the park? 
Anyway, they end up babysitting this one-year-old named Ricky, who's, I think, mom is friends with Angeline's mom. It all seemed to be going well, or so they thought, until it was revealed that Isabella, who was the one trusted with changing Ricky's diaper, had, like, just layered the diapers on top of each other instead of, like, putting a fresh one on each time. So long story short, he had like eight diapers on. In the end, they did get paid $20, but with what they owed to Jamie's dad for the lemonade, it was more like $10 but they weren't gonna try babysitting again. So they moved on to car washing, a suggestion via Jamie's mom. Luckily, they got a customer eventually, this old lady from across the street, but because Isabella um, shook their sign too hard trying to get people's attention, like the cars that would drive by, the four fell off because it was supposed to be 450, and they only ended up making 50 cents. Also, Angeline cuts her hair like the next day, which makes Isabella like really mad for some reason. So. The next day, while on the phone with Jamie, she cuts off Emily's hair. Yes, yeah, she's back, um, too. And then she rushes to Jamie's house to cut hers off, too, but Jamie's mom tells her no, luckily. However, Isabella ends up cutting off a chunk when Jamie isn't looking, so Jamie's mom ends up finishing the job for her, um, like, to even it out in the end. Now they've reached the halfway mark for raising this money, because I think they had, like, three weeks, and because of the money spent on the soap for the cars, Apparently, they now have less than what they started with, um, with $5.50. And also, no, Emily is not going to scream Topia too. They were just taking advantage of her, which is honestly a little sad. They end up asking Isabella's mom um, what they should do to earn money, and she offers to pay their full admission to the park if they clean Isabella's brother's room. Isabella declines, but like, it seems easy enough to um, Jamie and Angeline. Unfortunately, these plans also do not go as planned. Even though they not um, to no answer. They walk in on one of Isabella's brothers, um, biting his own toenails. Ew! But not to worry, um, simultaneously the girls had also set up an eBay auction with some of their old junk or whatever, which Isabella had been running. Basically, none of this stuff had sold, however. Isabella was kind of being secretive, and it was clear there was something else going on. She's up to her typical antics. So, when she finally got the computer alone, we discovered that she had made up a beauty product, and the reason she wanted Jamie to cut her hair was actually so that she could be the before picture uh -huh. for the beauty product, and Angeline could be the after. She didn't think this was actually gonna work, but it did. Luckily, the parents caught it in time, so they were able to just, like, cancel all the payments and nothing had been accepted yet. But at this point, the girls are now six days away from their deadline for the money, and speaking of the haircutting, when Aunt Carol saw how sad Jamie seemed to be about the whole thing, she revealed they would be going to Screamtopia after all, because the reason Angeline had cut off her hair was so she could sell it. Well, it was her original plan in Aunt Carol's defense. Um, she had just overheard Angeline and Uncle Dan Last minute though, um, remember how Angeline is very charitable? Well, she ended up donating her hair to a charity that donates hair for like kids um, going through medical treatment that makes them lose their hair. So she simply couldn't bring herself to sell it after hearing about this charity and donated it instead. In a last attempt to salvage this trip, Isabella got in trouble for selling a human head? It was a shriveled up peach, um, not just any peach, but the peach from the very first entry in the very first book that almost got Jamie the nickname Peach Girl. The first 10 pages or so of this book are actually when they're still in school and it's when it's wrapping up. So Jamie was cleaning out her locker and she found that like nasty old gross peach that she, she shoved it in her locker after this incident. So it was never to be seen again, well until now. But Isabella like loved it. So she let Isabella keep the peach. Anyway, um, Isabella sold it to her brothers for $300 and then they sold it to another kid whose dad happened to be a cop and that's where, you know, she finally got caught because he thought it was real. In the end, Jamie was still very touched by this gesture because she knew how much that Isabella loved that peach, so it showed what she was willing to sacrifice, I guess. And finally, we reached the deadline for the trip, but the girls had ultimately failed or... So they thought. See, this whole time, Emily had kind of disappeared and they didn't really think anything of it. You know how I briefly mentioned them taking advantage of Emily? Well, one of the things they wanted her to do was go up to houses and ask if she could walk their dogs, but um, the first house she went to, uh, she was given a child to walk instead. So she continued the child walking business and made just under $100, which on top of the 550 meant they had raised $100. Then they checked the 
eBay listing and the junk they had listed had actually sold and they had made another $200. In the end, Aunt Carol and Uncle Dan take everyone to Screamtopia, including Emily, thankfully, which they offer to cover costs for because honestly, like, she did all the work. <laughs> Book 11 is titled, Okay, So Maybe I Do Have Superpowers, and it takes place at the beginning of the school year. You know, the previous book took place during summer vacation. The first entry details how Jamie has actually spent a lot of time with um, Angeline over the summer, which made her realize that she's a lot more besides her looks and how it was just wrong of her to judge her for so long solely on that alone. She even said that it wasn't her fault she won the lottery in the looks department and personality department. The big event um, happening at the school during this book though is the fun fair, which is like an uh, event where they have like carnival-like games and stuff. I'm guessing the funds for like playing the games or like getting tickets to play go towards the school to raise money. Typically that's how those things worked. I remember doing stuff like that during school so I'm gonna assume that's how it worked because it wasn't really explained. So with this, the girls end up making making a bet, um, Isabella brings up a story to make her point about how bad Jamie is at these types of games and what happened last year. The bet starts off with Isabella betting Jamie um, to play bottle toss, the bottle toss game, like the ones they have at the carnival, and the loser has to take um, a one minute inhale inside Mike Minstetti's locker. Just then, Angeline objects, stating, no, the loser has to kiss him. Immediately, Isabella was on board and Jamie tried to object, but it was too late. Now, as the title suggests, Jamie becomes convinced she might have superpowers when Isabella suggests the idea. Basically, the kid I talked about in the last book that they tried to babysit um, lunged at Isabella when um, her and Jamie like stopped at Angeline's um, the other day after school or I don't actually I don't think they were in school yet. But Isabella, you know, due to her good in instincts, uh, moved out of the way and Jamie was right behind her. So he bit Jamie instead. Was that the bite of 87? And this made Isabella think that she gained some sort of superpowers because he might be radioactive or something. Anyway, on an unrelated note, Isabella starts to have this fascination a bit with sports. I think in a way to help her prep for this battle. So with this, she holds like an arm wrestling contest, which Jamie helps make posters for. And Emily ends up getting people like really excited and even promises like for some reason the prize is a horse. So when this kid named Jake, who we've never seen before, who is huge and strong wins and starts to demanding, where's my horse? Isabella decides to immediately bail. Luckily, Angeline's able to keep him calm with her cuteness and suddenly says he hasn't beaten everyone yet because he still has to beat Emily, which in a turn of events, he just like lets her win and even starts like uncontrollably giggling because of her cuteness. So of course now Jake is like shouting like, where's her horse? She deserves a horse. And this is where this whole thing gets a little crazy. Now that Isabella and Angeline both bailed, there was only one victim left. Jake stared at me and snorted and my superpowers told me that there was a chance that somebody was going to get punched in half at any moment. And that's when Angeline dragged Brentford up to the table. She slid a plate of cafeteria meatloaf in front of Emily. There's your horse, Mrs. Brentford said. Rehab was supposed to be a fresh start, but no matter how many starts I get, there's always the same ending. Also, apparently Isabella did that to bring Jake and Emily together. I don't know how true that is considering Angeline was the one who said Emily was the last opponent, while Isabella ditched them. Also, Hudson is very clearly still crushing on Jamie, but she's too oblivious to see and thinks that like he's got a thing for Angeline still for some reason. In in fact, when we finally reach the day of the fun fair, he tells her that he's been trying to ask her for weeks and catches Jamie like completely off guard. In the end, Jamie tells Aunt Carol and Angeline about the whole superpowers thing, to which Aunt Carol laughs so hard she almost chokes on her gum. When it comes to the bet, um, Jamie is so nervous, which Angeline knows because Jamie's been practicing in her backyard and Angeline even tried to help. Without fail almost every time though, Jamie threw the ball directly at Stinkette, so when it came to the actual game, Angeline gave her that very same advice, and Jamie was actually able to hit two of the three bottles. When it was Isabella's turn, however, Angeline, I guess, ended up telling the guy at the booth that 
Isabella was Jamie because they all remember the dart incident from last year and probably didn't want a repeat of it. Basically she threw darts at, not intentionally, at this clown running one of the games um, and they're all, they know this clown and what happened last year. So when the guy hears that this is Jamie, he just automatically gives Jamie the prize. Or Jamie, it's Isabella, but you know what I mean. Anyway, in the end, no one ended up kissing Pinstetti and in fact, Angeline was pretty nice to him. For context, when Emily declined Jake's offer to meet him at the fun fair because they already met. Angeline tried to show her that a girl could ask a boy to the fun fair, pressuring, or not pressuring, like, they're trying to convince Emily to go ask Jake to meet at the fun fair, basically, because she had declined him the first time. So Angeline used Pinsteady as her example, but she ended up hanging out with him anyway to be nice, so it was a nice ending. It's all in my tears and diary. And finally, we've reached our 12th and last book, which is titled Me, Just Like You, Only Better. Now, this isn't officially the end of the series. In this video, I won't be covering year two because 12 books was already a lot of reading. Maybe if this does well enough, I will definitely cover them in a part two. I'm curious since I actually haven't read them either. So this book starts out with Jamie's birthday coming up and what she wants to wish for is music related, I guess. Um, coincidentally, in art class though, Jamie has also been assigned a music poster project. And from the way she's describing her favorite band, I thought she was talking about Weezer at first, but I think it's just a made up band. And Jamie is specifically doing a poster about their new album, which is called Butter after their hit song, Butter Compared to You Girl is Margarine. <laughs> Through this book, she refers to the band as Fat Ald, which stands for frustrated and tired and a little disgusted. Anyway, shortly after this, this girl named Vicky wore a Fat Ald um, t-shirt to school to one up her, Jamie wrote fat old butter on her arm, but at lunch the sleeve like wasn't rolled up all the way. So, you know, Vicky saw it and started laughing and said, are you bragging or confessing? That's right guys, it looked like Jamie had fat butt <laughs> written on her arm. And after this, she's convinced that it's over for her and that she needs to move on from this band. Jamie is really the original music gatekeeper. Like she can't stand anyone being a fan of them cause like that's her band. and. I can't judge her for that because that is so real. <laughs> As the week goes on, she notices more people listening to Fat Ald and by Friday, Isabella had written it on her hand and Emily was wearing a Fat Ald t-shirt. During this time, Jamie moves on to a guy named Jared J. Fire and even decides to change her poster project theme. In return, Miss Anderson said that's fine because a lot of people apparently changed themes, like poster themes, last week to Fat Ald too. Coincidentally, the next day, Vicky was once again wearing a Jared J. Fire t-shirt, um, aka Jamie's new favorite artist, and the day after that, it only continued when Emily was listening to Jared on her iPod, and then she walked past Isabella's locker and she noticed she had a picture of Jared taped up inside on her locker door. With this, um, Jamie realizes they are clearly copying her because, you know, she's better than everyone else. So to prove it, she um, printed a picture of this singer like Jamie's mom used to like when she was her age and glued it to her notebook so that everyone at school would think that she liked him. By the end of the day, the next day, Isabella had taken down her Jared J. Fire picture and Emily was singing something that may have been a Verge Apollo song. So it's pretty clear to Jamie now that, okay, they are copying me. In fact, um, before the first bell rang at school, she even saw Angeline, who was listening to her iPod, um, by her locker flash Isabella a VA gesture. And um, that's right, that stands for Verge Apollo. So over the weekend when Isabella was helping Jamie with her birthday invitations. She asked Jamie about Verge like several times. So Jamie made up a bunch of stuff about him and by the time she left she was like a biggest Verge fan without even ever hearing his music. This causes again Angeline, Isabella, and Emily etc to change their music projects theme once again because Jamie says she's changing hers too. She also shares with us her new band relationship AKA the Whisker Brothers. She's not going to announce her change in art class though till next Monday, so that way the copycats won't have enough time to change their art projects. And for the first time out of any of these bands, Jamie goes on to quote lyrics from the Whisker Brothers hit song, Cupcake. Hey babe, don't be self-conscious. Your acne doesn't look out of place. It just looks like candy sprinkles on your adorable cupcake face. The next day at lunch, however, Mrs. Brentford kind of 
ruined everything in a way um, by playing Verge Apollo's music, which Jamie didn't even recognize at first. This made Angeline suspicious immediately. And the next day when she called to RSVP to Jamie's birthday party, she kind of got the confirmation she was looking for when she asked Jamie if she thought Verge would be good in concert. When in fact, not only was he old and bald, but he was also dead. So from this, Angeline knew immediately that it wasn't really Verge that she liked and that it wasn't Jared either. So on Monday when the posters were due, Jamie asked for more time, which Miss Anderson granted, but then Vicky, Emily, and Isabella also asked for more time. So then Jamie decided that she didn't need any more time and she revealed her poster of the Whisker Brothers to the class. As Jamie predicted, they all lied and said they were actually doing their projects on the Whisker Brothers, and the very next day, the Whisker Brothers had basically taken over the school. But Jamie wasn't done yet. She had actually offered to help hang up the music posters, and Miss Anderson said she had let her know when she needed them hung up. So later this week on Thursday, the day came, and Jamie also enlisted Emily for help because like she knew she could trust her due to her dumbness. After about 40 minutes spent after school, all the posters were finally hung up, but before they left, Jamie stopped in front of her poster for a moment, and the poster board was, you know, pretty thin. It was so thin that you couldn't really tell if you were holding one or two sheets of poster board, you see what I'm getting at? That's right guys, she was still making a fiddled poster. She also apologized to her diary for keeping this part of her plan hidden, but she was just worried that Isabella would read her diary again and spoil the whole thing. So the next morning, Angeline confronted Jamie on her fiddled poster, and when Jamie said the Whisker Brothers are awful, Angeline actually agreed, despite her notebook having a picture of the most repellent um, Whisker Brother on it. Most pictures had been removed from the lockers once again, and even at lunch, Vicky was wearing a hoodie over her shirt where you could see like the Whisker Brothers pathetically peeking out. Then to end off the book, Jamie actually finally has her birthday party, though her birthday isn't until the next day. And in a turn of events, Jamie basically got all Whisker Brothers merchandise. That's her birthday presents. Isabella also admits they were awful, so Jamie confronted her on why she copied her by you know, being a fan then, to which we find out that she wasn't copying Jamie, she was copying Emily. She explained how Emily is like the happiest person they've ever known, and she thought if like she did what Emily did, then she would be happy too. Jamie also asked Emily if she liked the Whisker Brothers, um, to which she said she copied Vicky. Then Jamie asked Angeline why she copied her, but Angeline said she did it on purpose to help her favorite band become a trend, because she thought Jamie would like, appreciate being a trendsetter. After getting all this information, Jamie thought, well, no one can deny Vicky was copying me for sure, but it actually turns out she was copying Angeline and has been for years. So finally, the next day on her real birthday, she ends up getting fat old concert tickets, which explains, like, her mom and dad's interest in what music she liked through the course of this book, specifically her dad. Though that should have been obvious, like, from the start, because we start off with Jamie saying all she wants is music-related presents or something this year. But when you're in middle school, you're a little more oblivious to things like that, I guess. So that was all 12 of the Series 1 Dear Dumb Diary books, and probably the part of this video most of you have been waiting for, we are going to take a dive into the movie as well. I mostly did Series 1 because that, I feel like, relates most to the movie, or that's what I assume. Three of the Year 2 books were actually out, I think, before the movie or at the same time, I forgot. I just briefly looked on Wikipedia and then I was like, oh, oh well, I'm sticking to this plan. But I did save the movie for last on purpose because I thought it would be cool to, first of all, if a lot of you haven't touched these books in years, re-immerse yourself in the story, but also to like compare like, okay, they left this out of the movie and I liked it or I didn't like it. So yeah, without further ado, let's dive into the live action movie. So the first thing I want to highlight is how cool the background is for like when Jamie is introducing herself um, in the kind of pre-movie introduction type scene. Similar to Die of Wimpy Kid, I liked how we kept the Jim Benton art style and this continues even in Jamie's diary in the movie which looks exactly how I thought it would considering she's an art kid. Also, we don't really know what her bedroom looks like from the books either, but um, let's say what they went with perfectly makes sense for Jamie. Her room reminds me of the various Disney Channel rooms um, I would see like over the years in shows and just wish for mine because my room was so lame. But not even like three minutes in, we have our first song of the movie, of course titled Dear Dumb Diary, since this is a musical after all. Are you sure you're supposed to be reading someone else? Poisoning. 
this sequence introduces us to our main characters or what they look like in real life versus the book, kind of doing a fade in dissolve type thing. I think they did the same thing in Die of Whoopi Kid. I would say for the most part, the casting was really spot on and especially with our main child actors, which is hard to come by with live action, like movie adaptations. So I really do give them kudos for that. I feel like the actors are everything with something like a live action because you want to really make sure you encapsulate what you're trying to recreate, I guess. So if you fuck that up, the castle kind of just comes crumbling down. But Jamie's mom is the only one that really looked a bit different to me and like kind of sh shocked me at first. I honestly thought she was going to be a brunette, um, although her actress, uh, Maddie Corman, did an amazing, like phenomenal job, honestly, and acted exactly how I thought her mom would act, especially in the scenes with like her sister and Aunt Carol, because they do bicker a lot in the book, but it's like all in good fun, like a simple sibling rivalry. The other thing that was different was how Isabella's signature lip smacker is now a lip gloss, and it's not Choco Mint, it's Watermelon Splash. I'm sorry, but Isabella would never use that flavor. What? Okay, but before we find out that information, we get our first scene with Hudson and Jamie. But I don't, I don't like what actually happened because I'm the type of person where if something is giving me like secondhand embarrassment, I end up skipping it. So this scene, I just, I can't. I didn't skip any other part of the movie. I just couldn't get through this scene. So sorry, I failed you guys. Um, but Hudson literally acknowledges Jamie and she's drinking this like strawberry milk. I think it's Trumu, which ugh, just got flashbacks to the times where people at lunch would get Trumu, like, I don't know, friends or people around me, and it would be like slime. Thanks, Michelle Obama. Anyway, she's drinking strawberry milk, right? And there, after there's this like long dramatic shot of her spitting out the milk and then like walking over to Hudson. Anyway, the main event that's happening, just like the books, is the jumpathon, which I believe happened in book four. They're all like mashed together in my brain now. My brain is like a soup. But more importantly, before we find out this information, we actually have our second musical number. And it's in this musical number that we see the iconic um, popularity scale by Isabella. I was gonna compare it to the one in the book, but there's actually like several. So I didn't wanna have to skim through all the books once again, just to find it. But can I just say, I love the prop that they have them like reference the popularity scale with. Like when I first watched it, I actually thought it was like animated and they were like walking up, but I think it's like actually a real prop that they made. I mean, the opening song gives us a good taste of what's to come, but this musical sequence is just, such a fun time. Jamie Kelly is truly the original girl boss. Also, Elephant in the Room, this song is of course such a banger. Perfect people of the world, you got to go. All the problems of the world will vanish when the freaks of nature are rounded up and vanish. I mean, come on now. And I say this, like, I'm not usually someone who's a fan of musicals when they don't need to be. But I feel like for Jamie, it's just very fitting with her character, especially with some of the more dramatic entries we see in her diary. The musical sequences um, basically tie into her diary entries throughout the film and are essentially like daydreams according to the plot summary. Anyway, during dinner that same night with her dad, which they give us this wonderful transition to. Hey, I came prepared. And while they are trying to survive her mother's food crimes, Jamie is a bit down, honestly, because she isn't enjoying school and she said she feels a bit invisible. And it's here where she comes to a revelation about what will help her stand out more than ever with the help of her extra shiny friend, Glitter. Cause no guys, this would not be an accurate telling of the Jamie Kelly life story if there wasn't glitter involved. There's one thing I know. <laughs> of shimmer. And we get an official Miss Anderson reveal soon after, and honestly, she does not look like what I pictured either. I thought she was gonna be a brunette too, first of all, but that's not really why. But she barely is relevant to the plot even, so like this doesn't hinder my enjoyment of the film at all. Not gonna lie, at first I was kind of confused what her plan was, because the pacing is like a bit weird at the beginning of this film. 
Um, let's just say we moved very, very quickly, and it definitely gets better as the movie goes on, I feel. Basically, we find out that this was a reference to the art show um, in book nine, where Jamie spends days on her art piece only to find out the show is canceled due to budget cuts in favor of the talent show. While in the movie, the art program altogether has been canceled due to budget cuts, along with a bunch of other programs, which honestly makes sense because the amount of like, movies where it's usually high school but in, this is middle school the amount of movies where like you know main character they're in school a lot of the plot has to do with the school the art program is like in shambles so this is where the jumpathon kind of comes into play and is also announced um at this assembly i don't even think i mentioned it's an assembly basically the jumpathon um will involve like five other middle schools in the district and i guess some local businesses had chipped in to give ten thousand dollars to the student who wins the jumpathon, or really the student's school who wins the jumpathon. So after finding out this information, Jamie, oh, she is pissed. She is fuming. So she heads down to the office to convince assistant principal Devins, more commonly known as Uncle Dan, um, that the art program is more important than he realizes because she makes a very good point. That's the cornerstone of the whole world of civilization. What the earth without art it's just eh. um he doesn't really care though he just tells jamie to be the change Being. and join the jumpathon so jamie makes a comment about how isabella said that all fundraising is a money hungry scam so her and principal devins kind of go back and forth with this conversation of isabella said this well did you know isabella did that and he literally ends up pulling out Isabella's permanent record and just starts reading it off to Jamie. Is that even legal? Isabella says the people who say things about her only do so because they're jealous. I'm not jealous of Isabella. So it's right here at the beginning of this movie that the whole office lady falling incident happens where she slips on one of those butterscotch candies. Although later, um, instead of the whole Jamie getting picked up by Aunt Carol resulting in the job offering, that doesn't happen. So she just only witnesses this fall in this film and this is the only time we see someone fall. Also, she calls to tell Isabella the whole story and tell me why. One, her having a neon pink domo and neon green walls just makes so much sense. And two, she's totally dressed like Courtney from Total Drama. Anyway, the next day at school, we see our typical meatloaf Thursday. And this time around, it turns out that the stealing Angeline's record is actually Isabella's idea. Even though um, when it happens in book one, it's actually Jamie's idea. But I was fine with this change, honestly, because it just made more sense to me. Also, Hudson Rivers comes up to Jamie and tells her she'd be really good in the jumpathon after he didn't see her name on the sign-up list. I wrote in my script that I'm convinced that every scene with Hudson is just going to be an incredibly hard watch. However, I think, you know, as we go on through the movie, it gets less hard because Jamie does like this, like, I can't breathe thing, um, which she also does after hearing the art program is going to be potentially no more. And with this, Jamie is doing the jumpathon, and it leads us into our next diary writing musical sequence, which is titled My Awesome This Is Awesome, which contains like this, it's basically like a major montage dance number that happens in the school's gym, I think. I don't have very much to say um, about this, except for really... There is no competition, there will be no contest. Now I'm on a mission to be the very best of the best of the best And unless you've got three legs and a built-in trampoline You've got no chance against me, even you, Angeline After this, we fast forward to the end of the school day and Aunt Carol picks up Jamie but when Jamie gets to the car, she's talking to assistant principal Devins and says that he offered her a job at the office also remember um, Angeline's various charities in the book. Well, I don't think I mentioned it because I tried to leave out things that literally were not important to the plot at all or else this video would probably be like 10 hours long. But basically remember when she wanted them to collect clothing to donate and Jamie had lied and then they went to the neighbors asking for clothing donations. Well, during that, this old lady gave them like a giant bag of granny panties. However, in the movie, they ask um, this older lady to donate to Jamie's jumpathon after her and Isabella realized Jamie needs to m make a considerable amount of money. Mind you, Angeline was already at $300 in just like 
sponsors alone. But this old lady mishears them for some reason and like just hands them this giant garbage bag. Confused, they open it and they find it's filled to the brim with giant granny panties. So the girls leave the garbage bag and they go to other houses for donations, which proves to ultimately be an absolute success. Although just like the books, Isabella collects money simultaneously for her other made-up charity. But during this whole time while they're collecting donations, Stinker finds the garbage bag of panties and just like spreads them all across the lawn, just like in the book. Only this time, instead of Angeline catching Jamie picking them up, Hudson drives past the house on his way home from soccer practice. To make matters like worse, the girls have this montage of them playing with the panties. So Jamie is actively wearing a pair on her head as a hat as he drives by. But the next day, Jamie goes to the office to try to get Angeline's record via Isabella's advice and discovers her Aunt Carol's impact on the office. Because she is Aunt Carol's niece, she was able to just go into assistant principal Devin's office. But before she can get the record, he actually walks back in uh, from his lunch break. And she really thought like he caught her in the act, but instead principal Devins brings up the um, Juvenile Optometry Foundation, AKA um, Isabella's made up charity that Jamie doesn't know is made up. So she helped make posters for her and hung them up around the school. He is so like enthusiastic about this charity. In fact, he gives Jamie money to contribute and ultimately apologizes for judging Isabella so harshly. That same night around dinner, um, Aunt Carol isn't home and is actually out on a date, which her mom like at first tried to hide from her. We also find out that Aunt Carol is actually 32. <laughs> I don't know why, but like from the way Jamie talked about her in the books, I thought she had to be in her mid 20s. And then um, like the book, Stinker ends up in Jamie's room and stinks up the room, no pun intended. So Jamie sleeps on the couch and instead of, um, I'm sorry, I don't care how corny it is, these little green screen doodle segments are so fun. I love them. Anyway, back to the plot. Um, Jamie wakes up and hears Aunt Carol and her mother talking about Carol's date. So she naturally eavesdrops um, to try to figure out who she was on the date with because she's very curious, but just like the book, she never does. Also, no, she doesn't continuously feed stinker things throughout the rest of this movie to try to get him to fart again. That just happened in the book. They didn't carry it over. But the next day at school, the whole Valentine fiasco happens with Miss Anderson. Just like we talked about in the books, um, we also get our next musical number, which is titled Just a Number. <laughs> This number happens right after Isabella informs Jamie um, from her study on the boys at the school that Hudson is actually the eighth cutest boy in the school. I gotta say the only part um, about the musical numbers that I can't handle is like the embarrassment, like after they finish. In this one specifically, she's like dancing around the room holding her diary as the bell rings. It's definitely accurate. Like I love you, Jamie Kelly, but <laughs> I'm so bad with watching stuff that's like embarrassing. It's like hard for me not to skip ahead. We also find out apparently the town's paper is interested in coming to interview Isabella and Jamie about the Juvenile Optometry Foundation because of all its success that it's seen. Shortly after this, they kind of break the fourth wall with what we think is going to be the next musical sequence, but it isn't. It's kind of funny because I was like thinking in my head when this was like going down, I was like, imagine if this was like real. And then they like broke the fourth wall. Carol, isn't this gonna be a musical number? Sorry. Budget cuts. We get our actual next music number the following day. Once again, it's Meatloaf Thursday, and Jamie takes notice of like Aunt Carol and Mrs. Bruntford's interactions in the cafeteria. Also, a big pet peeve I have about this film is the way like Isabella and um, Jamie interact with Angeline. Jamie, good morning. Feels like there's something electric in the air. Cute jacket, by the way. Um, it's like they've come into contact with an alien or something like I don't know what's so shocking about another human being Interacting with you like I'm sorry because unlike the book We don't even get an impression that like Angeline is even a malicious person But anyway, the next musical number is titled meatloaf mystery and is sang by the one and only mrs. Brantford I'll be the first to say um, what's four plus four eight. That's what she did What is it about school? That makes me love so mysterious. 
you hook like a book by Dickens. Add gray gravy and the plot just began. Like, I don't know, you know, if she just wanted me to eat the meatloaf, I'd probably just do it. Her actress, um, Leah DeLera, um, was honestly perfect for this role. Like, she was one of the standouts to me by far. Okay, this is before, um, obviously I filmed the footage you're watching now, but I was trying to figure out how to, uh, say Leah DeLera, um, because I didn't want to mess up her name, obviously. And, um, just, <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> this is actually my favorite song from the movie besides like the opening one not to say the others are bad but i think meatloaf mystery is quite underrated i feel like the only song i see people talk about um that isn't the opening is just a number which is um kind of mid my one takeaway though is why did they need the meatloaf to talk like that? I mean, talk at all, but like- Don't touch that broccoli. Not so hasty. Come try a bite of me. Mm, you know I'm tasty. This is terrifying! Now, obviously, I'm gonna admit it now. I never saw this movie growing up. I was more of a casual fan of Dear Dumb Diary. You know, Franny Stein was more of my favorite. I know I'm actively letting people down by stating this, um, but obviously I still have a ton of appreciation for this series. Like, regardless, I am just a very huge fan of Jim Benton's work, which is why I wanted to kind of revisit um, this, you know, series in general. But I'm just saying, if I saw this as a kid, I would have been terrified. This would have been in the front and center of my childhood trauma video. Anyway, um, it's right after this that Mrs. Brentford infamously, you know, eats her own meatloaf and says, call 911 and then collapses in the cafeteria, which Jamie also takes as the perfect opportunity to sneak off to the office and get Angeline's permanent record. When she gets to the office, though, the whole Valentine fiasco with Miss Anderson is currently taking place. Though this time, um, Devins and Miss Anderson go running out of his office arguing, so this gives Jamie, like, the perfect opportunity to sneak in and take Angeline's permanent record. She also takes notice of her Valentine, again, in his trash can. The heist is ultimately successful, though, with Jamie even going as far to steal the bowl full of, um, mini chocolate bars from the office. Shortly after this, we find out from Jamie's mom that they'll be holding a little party at their house for Aunt Carol on Saturday, which means Jamie needs to clean her room. And Jamie only really does this, though, because somehow her dumb diary during this time has gone missing, too. The next day at school, though, Jamie ends up finding out about how the Juvenile Optometry Federation was fake all along, and Isabella just, like, raised all the money so she could get contacts for herself. Um, and she colors them green, just like in the book. This results in, you know, them being in a fight, so Jamie decides ultimately to return Angeline's permanent record back to the office. Then we skip to lunch after, and because her and Isabella are arguing and Angeline has been nice to her the past two-ish weeks or so, she decides to try and sit at her table. But before she even gets too close, she notices they're laughing, and more importantly, what they're laughing at. That's right, guys. Um, they have Jamie's dumb diary. Turns out it wasn't lost in her room after all, and they are reading everything that she said about Hudson. So Jamie quickly ends up going home early, she runs out of the cafeteria, and has to resort to writing on a dumb piece of paper, in her words, instead of her, you know, diary, because obviously she didn't collect it, she just left. This leads to our next musical sequence, which is called Dear Future Jamie, which is just her kind of reflecting on if any of this is really gonna matter someday in the future. It's soon after this that Aunt Carol ends up coming in and returning um, Jamie her diary, and they kind of have a nice bonding moment where Aunt Carol tells her, you know, she wasn't always this cool. She shares kind of an embarrassing story about um, when she was Jamie's age and she threw up on a boy when he asked her to dance at the school dance. The message she's trying to get at though is how 
love can be painful and embarrassing but also the best thing in the world which I don't know why like that was the focus of this scene I thought it was gonna be more about how like you know school in general the middle school this phase of your life is embarrassing but luckily Jamie takes it as like what if life is just a series of embarrassing stories in her words so that message definitely came across too now tomorrow is actually the day of the big jumpathon too and Jamie didn't know if she would even show her face. That pep talk from Aunt Carol really gave her the encouragement she needed to show up anyways. The first thing like Jamie does when she gets to the gym the next day though is she says hi to Hudson which kind of made my skin crawl considering like he actually ignores her. Hi Hudson! Also, this whole movie, Jamie's outfits, have reminded me about how I used to dress in like fourth and fifth grade. I say that like fully as a compliment. Specifically, my favorite ones of hers are the fox themed outfit from the previous day and the unicorn leggings she's rocking for the jumpathon. The unicorn leggings kind of remind me of these gumball leggings that I got from Justice in 2014. Not gonna lie, I, you know, I would kind of slay those if I still had them today. But I wanted to highlight this because it really stood out to me and like I really liked this um, creative choice. In the books, they make it out to seem like Jamie just wears like t shirts and jeans all the time. But I think the style she rocks in this movie it makes a lot more sense if once again we consider she's an art kid. Like surely she'd take a liking to fashion as well and it's clear that she cares about trends of course. Anyway, that was a separate tangent. Um, Jamie notices Angeline hide behind like the bleachers in the gyms. So she ends up following her and confronts Angeline asking if she's okay. So Angeline reveals to her that she can't actually jump rope by herself and she feels like she's gonna really be letting everyone down because she has so many sponsors on her sheet. Again, $300 worth of sponsors before she's even done any jumps. So Jamie realizes then and there that she really can't let this happen because without Angeline's help, the art program would be doomed for all we know. And that's really the whole reason Jamie signed up anyways. Well, partly because of Hudson, but still. So Jamie immediately asks Mr. Dover if the rules state a jumper needs to be holding their own rope. And he says, no, they just need to be the individual jumping. So Jamie enlists Isabella for her help and Isabella rejects it just like in the book, but Jamie blackmails her um, because she's the only other person who knows the charity is fake and Isabella is actually touched by this, um, touched by the fact that she learned blackmail from her, um, so she obviously agrees to help. In the end though, Angeline wins and when Jamie is still kind of in shock that she helped Angeline willingly even after she read her diary, Isabella reveals the truth. See, after Jamie stormed out, um, Angeline had asked to see the diary and then she made up a lie that it belonged to her cousin Jenny and that it was a different Hudson. Oh, this is my cousin Jenny's diary. Uh, Hudson Johnson. That's who she's talking about. Jenny goes to Weeks Middle School. She's going to be so glad that I found this. So with that knowledge, it's pretty obvious that Angeline was the one who returned the diary to Aunt Carol. The only question now was why was Hudson, you know, ignoring Jamie? Well, turns out um, Isabella had stepped on his throat um, while he was doing some warm-up stretches because due to her contacts, she didn't see him lying there. So the next day, the party from book five happens um, with all the teachers coming to Jamie's house. I was honestly kind of sad to see that the plot of Isabella and Mrs. Brentford joyfully popping Miss Anderson's car tires didn't come to fruition in the live action because honestly, that was such a funny interaction to me. Although we do see a scene later at the party where they are having like, they're dancing together basically. It was as though no beyond earth. But anyway, let's um, not fast forward. What we do find out though is um, of course, assistant principal Devins and Aunt Carol are getting engaged and that Angeline is his niece. But although Jamie is not really trying to get Stinker to fart in her room during this book, one thing they do stay true to is Stinker's delightful surprise for all of Aunt Carol's guests. I will say my favorite thing from this movie that didn't happen in the book is what happens next. By talking to the school counselor, I think it was, Jamie and Isabella found real kids who needed glasses and they raised more money since, you know, Isabella spent it all on contacts. So they were able to right their previous wrongs or 
should I say, Isabella's previous wrong. So they were able to end up being interviewed after all and put in the town paper for their charity, and it's actually real. Now, would Isabella ever do this? No. I honestly don't think so, but I love it nevertheless. And that's pretty much it for the movie. Um, although it does close with another fun musical song titled May the Dumb Be With You, which is also very catchy. Honestly, who am I kidding? This movie has like no misses when it comes to its soundtrack. But overall, I think this movie did a really great job with making sure to incorporate parts of the books into the story. My only complaint really is that we didn't get to see a friendship form between Angeline and Jamie like we did in the books. My guess is it's because this is really the surface level of what happens in the books, so I honestly can't be too upset. But to end this video on a high note, um, now we'll answer the question that you've probably all thought to yourselves as we've revisited the world of Jamie Kelly. Man, you know, I missed your dumb diary. When is it coming back? Well, Boy, do I have some news for you. As of um, March 4th, 2021, via an interview here on YouTube, Jim Benton actually said he was in the talks with Scholastic, you know, once again, about doing some graphic novel versions of Dear Dumb Diary with all new stories, just, you know, of course, in graphic novel form. And I think it's, um, I think we're at 18 books and Scholastic, we're, I'm talking to Scholastic right now about doing some graphic novel versions. Awesome. Do the whole thing is, um, I'm, I'm, it'll be all new stories, but it will be as a graphic novel. I am honestly a huge fan of graphic novels. Like, since I've gotten older, I've honestly fell out of reading. But when I do read, I mainly turn to graphic novels. So I'm honestly really stoked about this, and I really hope it happens. As of 2023, though, I really couldn't find an update on these potential new books. But again, like, these things take time to write, so... You know, I'm hopeful it will happen with time because Jim Benton released a Franny K. Stein book as early as 2021, which, in fact, in this same interview, he actually said he was finishing up writing. It was Mood Science, which I believe is the most recent Franny K. Stein book. But if you're interested in Jim Benton or, you know, just the perspective and like what went into writing this book series, I definitely recommend checking out this interview. I'll link it in the description because I found out some other information from it as well, like, you know, the early process of the books and stuff. And that was it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed and let me know your thoughts um, as always in the comments below. This was honestly super fun to make, though I had to do a considerable amount of reading. I really didn't plan for this video to be this lengthy, it just kind of happened, and I've been really wanting to shift my focus more into quality of what I'm making versus quantity because, well, quantity, I want it to be longer, but my favorite videos to watch are always just like lengthy, lengthy videos talking about something that's so niche, I feel. So it was really exciting to actually do that um, myself. And I will see you guys in my very next video.